progress. Um, just a few welcomes and apologies, first of all. We've got um, 10 or 11 people joining us from uh, a variety of, of areas, so press, public, and from um, particular interest groups but, uh, across the NHS generally. Um, so welcome to you. Well, welcome to, to our public board for the Integrated Care Board. And then obviously uh, welcome back to all our other board members from the ICB. Um, I've got some apologies. First of all, Julie Sharma from uh, uh, Serona and uh, Julian Fleming, I think, is with us. Yeah, Julian, I can see you back on the screen. I've got an apology from Will Warrender from the Ambulance Service. Um, apologies from Stephen Peacock and Hugh Evans from Bristol City Council. Uh, apology from Joe Medhurst, our, our medical director. And an apology from Maria Kane, who's poorly and has lost her voice as well. So um, those are the apologies I've got. Has anybody got any other apologies that I haven't mentioned? Jeff, I think Hugh is actually going to be here for the open meeting. Oh, all right, you said he wasn't, but, but yeah, OK, fine. Um, great, well, OK. Um, so before I progress, just a reminder to board members that the meeting is being recorded and that's so we can record the minutes accurately and that they'll be made available on the website. If you do need, if you do want to ask a question uh, in the normal manner, can you uh, remotely uh, or technologically raise your hand because I can't see everybody on the screen all at one time and can anybody on the call remember to uh, mute their microphone unless they're speaking or we will get re reverberation back on the line. If you want to use the chat function at all, uh, that won't be captured by the team who are doing the minutes. So if you're putting stuff in the chat, it might not get captured in the in the or probably won't get captured in the minutes. So you might need to make the point verbally in the session if it's important. So um, without further ado, I will unless there's anything else on on uh, welcomes or apologies I've missed. No, OK, thank you. I'll move us on to uh, declarations of interest. Is there any declarations of interest anybody would like to raise that they haven't previously raised at the board and that we've recorded? No, OK, thank you very much. So the minutes of the meeting of the 6th of October have been circulated. Can I just check if, if people are happy with those minutes or whether there's any uh, items on there that anybody would like to, to um, discuss, raise or comment on? No, so I can't see any hands at the moment. So I'll move on to the uh, matters arising and most of them are closed, but there's three that are remained open. The first one was around um, voluntary uh, sector involvement, Shane, and I know you've done an awful lot since we last met around voluntary sector engagement. So I don't know whether you want to just give the board a quick update on where we are with that. Yeah, thank you very much, Chair. So colleagues, both on the voluntary sector, the citizen's voice and also the health and, and care professionals. So health and care professionals, lots of work going on. Rosie as chief nursing officer, uh, met with um, a lot of the health care professionals yesterday and we've had a good process and a, and, a, and a structure for them to become involved. And I'm sure chair over time will bring that. Actually, it would be good to bring them to the board, actually, and an opportunity for the board to see the work they do. We, with regards to the patient voice and with regards to VCSE, the patient voice, we've had a couple of very good meetings with patient representatives and people with lived experience. We've drafted a proposal for how people with lived experience could feed into all levels of the organisation. And actually the people with lived experience have taken that away and said, well, let us have a look at it. Let us have a rewrite of it and we'll come back and give you our thoughts. So they've agreed to come back in the next couple of weeks. Very productive meeting. Then the final element was VCSE, so an awful lot of engagement going on VCSE. The VCSE Alliance have presented a paper to us which would suggest how they might become um, involved um, and, and really become involved. We're just reviewing that paper because clearly um, it has a well, it has a cost tag to it because it's important that if we want them involved, we may have to, in fact, compensate them for their time, etc. But more importantly, it's actually a really good paper that could set the, the way forward how we're going to engage. So we have the paper now myself and Colin as Director of, of Strategy and Partnerships will work together. Um, I have no doubt we will come to a good place and we'll have a good engaged approach with the voluntary community sector. So all three are progressing, Chair. OK, thank you, Shane. And, um, you know, really important. I mean, this meeting is a meeting held in public, but it's not a public meeting. 
Um, and I think we're all pretty much in agreement that we want to ensure that we are hearing the both the citizen and public and patient voice in our conversations. And I think my experience of chairing boards is the conversation becomes a lot richer by having that that voice in here. Now, we do need to think about how we manage the time on that and how we are able to incorporate that in what is always going to be a really tight agenda. Um, but I think across, as Shane has said, across the whole of the system, we need to think um, and we need to think outside the box on this one. And I, I'm really pleased that Shane has taken the approach where he's asked those people who particularly got a lived experience with health and social care, how they think we should engage in the best way. And, and as he said, we've had some really, really fruitful conversations. Um, but I'd be interested in board views on this one as well before I move us on. So, Ellen? Um, so, sorry, Jeff, I've, I've not got necessarily a view. I'm, I'd just like to thank Shane for that work and I and I really applaud his approach on that. Um, any idea on timing, Shane? Because I'm really keen that we have that patient citizen voice on the committees. Yeah, so what we we had put a very short time from it, Ellen, because that's just the way we want it to be. And, and they actually said, no, let's go away and think about it. We are not talking about years and years here. They're coming back to me in the next two weeks with their thoughts and their views. Um, and I'd like to turn that into something which will, will be on the ground in, in months, not years. Um, the original concept was creating like a, a, a lived experience practice. So in other words, creating a group of individual lived experience that we could then call off when we wanted particular lived experience expertise in the various bits. Um, so it, we could probably get it started to get it to the, the real place like to get to. We might be talking to hundreds of people here, but I think we can start within the next couple of months. Thank you. You're on mute sorry, there, Jeff. I don't, yeah, sorry. Uh, I don't know if others have got any views on on citizen engagement and patient involvement. I mean, we are doing quite a lot around this and I am keen that we we pursue this agenda because it would be very easy for us to operate in isolation, but we can't allow that to happen. So, Rosie, you're on mute, Rosie. Sorry, apologies, Chair. I was just saying we had a great couple of days uh, showcasing some of our work around learning disability and autism last week, and we had several groups of people who are working alongside us who have lived experience or who are autistic. And they are just fabulous at holding us to account. Um, so I think we've got some we've, we've got some great work already happening. We've got some great opportunity to draw those people into our broader work. Um, but they were just fab at kind of holding the mirror up for us in a really positive way. Great, thanks, Rosie. Dave. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. And just just to re uh, uh, reinforce the you know the support in respect of hearing that patient voice, uh, but also hearing the wider voice as well from a population health uh, perspective and, and ensuring that we get that voice heard um, uh, equally as well is really important. So, so Shane, I think we've got a further conversation on this, but I think it'd be really helpful to, to do this sooner rather than later and, and ensure we are, we're, we're never going to capture everybody's voice, but we should really make sure that we're as open and transparent as we, we possibly can be. So yeah, some, some good some good progress on that and, and thanks to uh, board members' contributions around that as well. Um, the the final agenda item, sorry, the final action that's open is around the lessons learned for the mass uh, vaccination program. So I don't know who's who is got this because it's not action to an individual. But um, Rosie, is this something you've got? Or uh, sorry, Dave. <coughs> Jeff, sorry, I think this might be an action that I closed down last month. Actually, um, we've now engaged the mass vax team. Um, in a in a range of programs, particularly the CVD uh, program, about making sure we optimise the the lessons learnt in 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 those programs. So I think I I thought I closed that down last month. Apologies. Okay, thanks, Dave. Uh, anything else for anyone on the actions from the last meeting? No. Okay, in that case, I'll move us on to the uh, chief execs uh, update report. So Shane. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, <clears throat> colleagues, as always, um, I've tried to produce a, a succinct document just to give an update. Lots and lots on the agenda today around decision making and in terms of uh, the issues with regards to governance and oversight, etc. So I, I haven't gone in that in my report, although they're important things from a chief executive perspective. The three things I wanted to call out in the report, and you have seen the paper. Um, <clears throat> the first one is about decision making framework and the amount of work that's been going on between all partners to understand how we best make decisions. That's a, a 
paper on today's on today's agenda but i just need to stress how important this is this underpins um how we will work as a system and therefore it is a really important part of the thinking that's going on as i say with non-execs with execs across the icb the second big thing just to bring to attention is I, I raised with you at the last meeting and the meeting before the ICB organizational restructuring we're going through. Um, <clears throat> I talked about a four phase approach and uh, I just want to update the board as I said I would um, that we are on target with the four phases that we're looking at. We're firmly in the middle of phase two and phase two is about where we're beginning to redesign uh, the structures within the organization uh, in partnership with the people who who work in the organization um, and it is it is moving at pace um, <clears throat> we hopefully will get to phase three in line with the january 2023 time frame which we had set out um, and what I would just say is as part of that reorganization, um, uh, we obviously had one final uh, director post to be filled, which is the chief people officer. And just to make the board aware that we have made an offer uh, to an individual um, and we're awaiting a response as to whether they have accepted that job. <clears throat> the final bit then I want to raise, which is the big part of my report, is about winter planning. Um, and we've just talked a lot at our board meetings up until today around uh, how we prepare for winter and, and various things that are happening in winter. Um, we took a little bit of a, um, a review about three weeks ago to say actually is our plan working and are we making the difference we wanted to make? And no matter which way we looked, we kept coming back to the, the major, major objective of winter is actually about keeping people safe, particularly with regards to no criteria to reside. You know, no matter which way we cut this, the most important thing for winter is can we get flow and can we assure ourselves that people who don't need to be in hospital aren't in hospital? Because we know that causes the an, a massive amount of harm, both to the individual in the bed, because we know about decompensation physically and cognitively, but also in flow in terms with regards to ambulance, etc. So what I have outlined to you is now the approach that we are, are taking and we've tried to, a best way I can describe it is declutter the pitch. Um, and we're really saying we had lots and lots and lots of things we wanted to do. And really what we're now doing is refocusing many of the projects we had into the flow improvement program with the single aim is about trying to ensure we get as many people out of hospital as is physically possible. And you can see under figure one on page four, really what the eight big things we are now doing for winter in terms of discharge to assess, massive input into virtual wards, implementing the new stroke model, a community falls response, care traffic control, which we've discussed before, which is moving on, a big focus on high intensity users, which Dave is heavily involved in, the focus on ham ambulance handovers and obviously care sector capacity. And you will be very well and have highlighted in this report is the recent announcement of further investment from the centre with regards to 500 million across England. Um, and we have had more than our fair share, and I mean that statistically more than our fair share, the way it has been allocated. In fact, BNSSG has received uh, a very high proportion of that money given the challenge that we face. So I just wanted to raise that as, as the update, Chair. I've, I've, I don't wish to go into huge detail, people have read the paper, but I just want to re-emphasize the importance of uh, winter. We are all over it that's what we have to do this year if we are to get on to our strategic aims of population health health and improvement health improvement uh, value for money and also social and economic change um, we have to deliver winter this year because if we don't deliver winter we will never get the airspace to actually get on to the other things that really make a huge difference to our population so you have the report chair happy to take thoughts comments or questions okay thanks shane i'll, I'll open up to um comments or questions then so i've got steve first of all then alison so thanks shane really welcome the report and absolutely agree that the focus that you're prioritizing in terms of winter pressures it is a system uh, focus obviously because we can't do anything unless we all join things up and i guess the risk uh, part of the risk in here is to make sure that we are really supporting the workforce in all of the organisations, provider organisations, to be able to support this. And um, I guess one of our challenges is going to be the pace at which things need to move in order to get the flow to work. So everything has to be joined up. Every part of the system is uh, working effectively together. So this 
is absolutely the right thing to do and we all need to support and focus on it. Thank you, Steve. And I, and I think the focus, I hope the focus is on making systems and processes work better so as to make the job of the individual in the ward or the job of the individual care worker, etc., actually manageable. At the moment, I mean, having had the pleasure of working in hospitals many a year, you know, the worst thing is when you're doing lots and lots of work, but you're doing it with patients who shouldn't be there. They need to be somewhere else. Um, and therefore, you know, the aim of this is clearly to make sure patients aren't in the wrong place but it has to focus on making a productive workplace. And at the moment, our workplaces are not as productive as they can be because actually we have um, an inability to get people to the right place of care. Yeah. Thanks, Shane. Uh, Alison? Thanks very much, Jeff. Shane, thank you very much. Really helpful report. Just on the, the eight F priority areas, um, I, am I right in assuming that what sits below those headlines in the boxes is a very quantifiable, detailed work stream where you can see when progress is being made in a very clear, tangible way? Um, and, and if so, it is all of that within that um, the for us to deliver this is everything that sits below those headings within the control of partner or partners in the system. So it's within our within our gift, if you like. And I, and I guess if that's the case as well, what, what what's the bit that's worrying you slightly more that you think you need to pay a little bit more attention to, or maybe you've got more confidence in? No, uh, really great question, Alison, thank you. Um, in terms of the plans below it, what, what I was really keen to do, and I've been working closely with Debs and Lisa, is that we, and I use the word sort of strip out, we strip these back to key things that we need to do. And we as an executive team are monitoring on a weekly basis, are we hitting the targets we need to hit this week? We then have agreed with the chief executives group, which is if we have a major blockage in that week, then we have the ability to call the chief executives together at that moment in time. We've done it once so far with regards to the recruitment of staff for the virtual wards. So what we're doing in a very dynamic way, this isn't let's set a project up for three, six, nine months. We're doing this as the rhythm of winter on a daily and weekly basis. And Deb's office have then been really clear in the middle of this, as with Lisa, to make sure that if we have to make decisions daily and weekly with chief executives, we have the vehicle to do that. If I am going to, if your second question is about risk, I look in on the risk and I suppose the risk for me isn't that we won't have the systems in place, but there is a massive cultural shift we're trying to do in a very short moment of time. So for example, if, and as I have had the pleasure of working in hospitals for a long time, um, if we are to get mm -hmm. patients from a hospital to a community environment, we have to build trust, trust in the clinicians in the hospital, that our systems are good and sound, and trust in the community that they will be receiving patients. And what's really interesting is our biggest risk is that we're trying to do this in, at speed, when we probably, if you had a longer period, you spend more time building trust uh, between the organisations and between clinicians. So that for me is the biggest risk, Alison, is not the systems. I think we can get the systems up and running. We're, we're pretty good at that kind of stuff, but it's actually getting the trust built in a very short period of time. And, and I know, I mean, Julian's on from Serona and, and Eugene's on from, from UHBW. You know, I think it's very clear that's the challenge we have. Can we build that trust that professionals can say, OK, it's all right for Mrs Smith to go home today because I know someone's going to catch Mrs Smith in the community. Whereas if you don't have that trust, you go, I'll keep Mrs Smith for another day. And it's it's that kind of trust building, Alison. Thanks a lot, Shane. That's helpful. Thanks, Shane. Lisa? I just wanted to come in on that is um, sitting behind this, Alison. Yeah, there are plans that work through. And what we've done in those plans is we've set aside those actions that we need to complete for winter and those which would be part of our longer term delivery. And some of the actions we're needing to take for winter wouldn't necessarily be in the direction of travel we want to do. So, for example, under discharge to assess, we want to move to a much more home based independence based model of care we won't necessarily be able to do that and get through this winter and therefore we've commissioned additional um, nursing home beds but it's it's that clear delineation between these are the actions for now and this is about how we're then supporting going into the future direction of travel as well okay th thanks lisa uh 
Any other questions or comments for Shane on his update? No? OK, in that case, I'll move us on then. Uh, the next items we've got around um, items for assurance and approval. And the first one is around clinical commissioning policies. Um, and I think, Rosie, you're picking up the first one here around fertility treatment services. Yes, thank you, Chair. And I'm very pleased to welcome um, Christopher Maloney and Dr Peter Goida to talk to us about this policy, which they spend a huge amount of time making sure we review um, really effectively. So I'm going to hand over to uh, Chris and Peter to take us through the key parts of this policy and the changes we're making. Lovely. Thank you, Rosie. So Chris Maloney here from the Commissioning Policy Development Team. Um, it's probably worth just giving a little bit of background uh, before we move on to hit the high notes of the criteria and the policy itself. Um, each of the organisation's commissioning policies has a review date, which is set at three years from the date of adoption. Um, that was the reason for this particular review. And the scope of the review for our fertility assessment and treatment policy was agreed by the then CCG's clinical executive. Um, that scope was then taken out to our community and we at the commissioning policy development team undertook three months of uh, patient public involvement work which then informed um, the policy or the review of the policy that we've just undertaken and there are two other key considerations that shaped our review which are worth mentioning before we move on and first is while our policy has reflected nice guidance and best practice it's recognized that our stance particularly on fertility preservation needed to be considered in order to provide greater equality of opportunity for people to access this treatment uh, who are undergoing NHS care that would have a negative impact on their fertility. Uh, similarly, we needed to consider our position to only fund assessment and treatment of fertility issues for people in couples, as again, this is an area that left us open to um, challenge under the Equality Act. Secondly, there was a clear steer that the revised policy should not lead to an increase in the organisation's overall fertility spend. Therefore, any changes to the policy's criteria that could broaden access and increase activity and cost should be mitigated within other areas of the criteria. Um, as mentioned, we undertook a three month period of PPI um, to give our population the opportunity to let us know how they wanted us to prioritise our review and changes to the policy. The highest priorities were identified as broadening the scope of fertility preservation and prioritising the length of time someone has tried to conceive without success over their relationship status. And so the proposed policies are a response to that input from our communities and those those two uh, aforementioned factors. Um, I'll hand over to Peter, who's going to talk about the criteria itself and put a bit more meat on the bone. Hi, I'm Peter Goy, the GP uh, in the area and clinical lead for exceptional funding and policy development. Uh, Looking at the two policies, the infertility assessment and treatment policy, the key aim of this policy is to enable investigation and treatment for individuals or couples where infertility is likely to be present. Focusing on the changes from the previous policy, as Chris has said, NICE has not updated its guidance for a number of years. So most changes are focused on issues highlighted in the consultation or around matters of equity. Access to services are based on not having been able to become pregnant. The criteria of not having become pregnant despite the regular unprotected intercourse over a two year period is unchanged. The previous requirement for at least 10 cycles of self funded intrauterine insemination from a human fertilization and embryology approved centre has been reduced to six cycles. This change is based on specialist advice that this is a reasonable marker of infertility, but also is more achievable by couples and individuals. The current policy also, um, so the current policy allows early referral where there's no ovulation, where the fallopian tubes are blocked, and where there's azoospermia, no sperm. These have been updated to include individuals with severe endometriosis or the sperm count of less than one million per mil both being situations where infertility is extremely likely. As Chris has mentioned, in order to remain within the financial envelope, considering the changes in both policies, the top age has been reduced to age 39 from 40. This is in line with a number of other areas uh, geographically, and Chris will explore this later. Looking at the fertility preservation policy, the current policy was based on NHSE guidance to provide gamete preservation for patients on cancer pathways where fertility may be affected. 
it's been very clear that this was not an equitable position. The key aim of the policy is to provide gamete preservation for individuals whose fertility is likely to be significantly affected by NHS commission treatments. The majority of patients will be in the following groups of NHS patients. As well as individuals who are on the cancer pathway requiring chemotherapy, the individuals where the use of certain drugs may have similar effects, and so they'll be included. Examples include patients who may need cyclophosphamide for certain renal or respiratory conditions and where there are no other clear alternatives, or the individuals prescribed hormone therapy as part of the gender dysphoria pathway. Individuals will also have access to gamete preservation where surgical treatment is likely to lead to the removal of a second ovary or a second testis. So those are the significant changes within the policies. So let me hand back to Chris. Thanks, Peter. So just to pick up on Peter's comment around we are lowering the age of prospective mother from 40 to 39 years. Um, it's worth noting that of the 100, the, the last check of the 192 systems with a fertility policy, 50 have an upper age limit that is under 39. Um, and that includes several of our peer CCGs. So we are not therefore an outlier in this approach um, among other systems. There is no change to the range or manner of services that we're going to be delivering, even though we're, we are broadening access to uh, to fertility services, we're not changing the services themselves. Therefore, the policy doesn't pose any, any risk to patient care. The risks that have been listed in the paper that's been circulated are financial, um, and they are around the inclusion of single women predominantly within our new policy. So we don't know for sure how many single women will seek funding. No data is collected locally on that, that could inform us. So we've had to use some national data about this. It's also worth noting that of the very few um, health systems that do fund single women, this is generally done through an exceptional funding request and it's not managed under policy. Um, so it is possible that demand could be greater than expected, in which case a rapid policy review could be instigated. However, reflecting on our own EFR data from the last few years, it is unlikely that it will exceed the levels that have been indicated within the paper. Um, the second risk is connected to the transition period uh, for the policy that has been uh, identified in the paper. So we've lowered the upper age limit of the prospective mothers from 40 to 39 to offset activity connected to single women and broadening the criteria of our fertility preservation policy. In order to ensure that women aged 39 and 40 are not unfairly disadvantaged by this new policy. We would not stop funding treatment for women aged 39 or over for nine months to a year after implementation. So therefore we would not fully mitigate costs connected to fertility preservation in the first year. However, some of the costs associated with new policy are currently being accrued as the CCB will fund fertility preservation via the exceptional funding route for people on a gender dysphoria pathway where the intention is to transition. So therefore, the full extent of expenditure is likely to be lower than stated in the paper, which, which gives us the top estimate. We've been in touch with our comms team who have developed a handling plan for this and uh, local councils and MPs have been are being briefed. And so we are confident the appropriate level of scrutiny uh, from those partners will will also be taken. So that's it for me, unless Peter or Rosie would like to add anything else. No, my, my, my only other bit, uh, thank you, is just to um, let the board know that this has also been reviewed by our commissioning policy review group and through our clinical review re review group, which is a subcommittee of the HCPE. So it's been reviewed by our clinicians as well prior to coming here and is recommended by those two groups. OK, th thanks, Rosie, and, and thanks to Chris and Peter for, for joining us and give us uh, the detail of the uh, of the paper. It's really helpful. Thank you. Can I ask board members whether there's any comments or any questions people would have around the uh, policy proposals? Alison. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, and thanks, Peter and Chris. Um, this policy can be quite an emotive policy. And, and, I, and I think what I'm seeing through the changes, particularly under the risk section, is that there's an evidence base that's supporting the decisions that the, the proposals that you're making. So I just want to confirm 
that the risks that you've outlined, you think you you think we've got good mitigations for um, if there were any um, legal challenge or, or reputational damage. So just just to just to go back on that one, because I think that's quite important. I don't mind if you want to take that or me, Peter. And I, I think we're really clear that the evidence is supportive of this approach. Uh, what we're also clear on is that we now have a legally safe policy and that we are providing through this equitable access uh, for our population, which sadly was not the case before, although we were mitigating it through the exceptional funding route. And I think the other bit, Alison, is the other risk mitigation is, is any women who are in that age gap now where we're making the change will have their treatment on it. It'll be for new referrals after this policy is signed off. So again, we're, we're, we're not disadvantaging women already going through the process because we were obviously we in mind with women on that cusp of 39, 40 and, and uh, respecting their needs as well. Okay, thank Thanks, you. Uh, any other comments or questions? John? Yeah, can I just ask um, if this policy is approved by board today, uh, what will be the um, process of communicating it to um, people working in, in the sort of primary care service so that we're, we're aware of the change and, and that we don't give people false hope or false information? Communication uh, will be within days uh, with primary care, with other providers and uh, through the press releases which are uh, going out. Uh, so the communication in particular with primary care is very rapid uh, and, and the wording of that has already been agreed. Excellent, thank you. Thanks, Peter. Thank you, John. Um, any other comments or questions? So we're being asked to approve the changes. Uh, sorry, Steve. So it's just on that communications bit. If we've got, as we bring, bring this in, if it's approved, then if there is any documentation in patient waiting rooms or wherever, just making sure we've updated websites so we've got clinicians and communities fully understanding. Otherwise, we'll end up with a bit of a, a bit of a problem, I think. I thought it was a really well written paper, by the way. Thank you. Steve, Jane. Just a quickie, given that I've lived the experience of the whole IVF and HS thing and um, endometriosis and everything. Uh, it would also be on the communication front really, really useful for anyone who was considering um, going through this process in order to conceive, to know what the timescales are for different things, um, in a way just general awareness so that they know that if, if they were going through this process they should think about it quickly because if we're cutting off a year it may mean very little in, in the broader scale of things but it may make the difference for others. Um, it wouldn't have for me, um, I, I was slap bang in the middle of that, that um, uh, 30 to 40 period but um, yeah I, I think just having that communications piece for, for patients and, and citizens generally so that they're aware would be helpful. Chair, Vicky? Okay. Yes, I'd, I'd agree with uh, Jaya. Um, and I think also communication. I, I think, people, you know, women are actually having babies uh, at an older age now, and it's not unusual to have a child. I had one myself, 42. So um, I think it is quite a, a sort of worry that people might be thinking that they could go and start the procedures, um, you know, in the in the late 30s and still be able to achieve a child, whereas it, it could take an awful lot longer than that. But um, yeah, I think seeing women, I think, are often thinking about it a lot later than they used to couples even um you know that i think that's really important the communication if that, that if that change happens thanks vicky any other comments or questions so is, is there any dissenting voices to the approval of the policy okay i'm seeing there's not so i think as a board then we are happy to support the policy and um Thank you very much again to Chris and Peter for the time you've given us this afternoon. It's been really helpful and has really brought the policy to life. So well done. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Jen. Uh, uh, can I move us on to the next item then, which is the um, NHS England operating framework? And I think, Lisa, you're going to pick up this item. Or is it? Oh, yeah, sorry, Lisa. Is, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. So um, there are two components to this item. 
One is um, the consultation on the enforcement guidance and the second is the memorandum of understanding that underpins the NHS oversight framework. So if I can start on the enforcement guidance, um, this is a consultation period that's underway at the moment from NHS England um, around the um, enforcement guidance that will apply to both providers of NHS services that hold a provider licence, but also to integrated care boards, which is why I felt it was important for it to come to the board in terms of our response. Um, the key components in terms of the enforcement guidance consultation is, is a real request for the provider licence to be in place, for us to be actively supporting our providers to have the provider licence, but also the key changes that NHS trusts are required to have a provider licence. Um, within the provider licence, and this is a transfer of powers that happened under the legislation that came into force in July from monitor to um, NHS England is around the enforcement guidance that can put a provider into breach of the licence. One of the key bits of this, it asks the ICB to recommend and to support. Um, one of the things that we've pro we've talked about in previous board meetings and considered as we, we work through um, our arrangements, there are very few issues that are due to a provider operating in isolation often where a provider is in breach or failing to deliver against um, the, the core set of standards within a plan or within the oversight framework, it is a, is a combination of requirements across the system. So um, the recommendation in terms of our response to the enforcement um, guidance is for effectively to be able to respond to NHS England to, to reflect that in terms of the request that says, how do we distinguish between where a provider is you know failing to act as opposed to the system having as a core element of our responsibility so wanting to respond in terms of the enforcement guidance very much in terms of saying actually this is about enforcement against the icb and the icb are holding itself to account in terms of its response in regard to those arrangements as opposed to individual organizations within the icb so that's the element around the provider license. The second is directly around the integrated care board and the regulatory action proposed around the integrated care board is effectively um, two phased. One is about saying where the integrated care board is at risk. And obviously the integrated care board is by its nature a collective of partnerships. It isn't it one in part of the organised system working in, in isolation. It's about how we collectively respond. So the recommendation in terms of our response in regards to um, the integrated care board is that it should be in context of our providers. So it should be about how the integrated care board um, is clear as one step. It should be akin to the provider license. So it, as a single phase in terms of our arrangements, but also to be really clear, is it around our direct commissioning responsibilities, i.e. things like continuing healthcare, or is it about our provider? And making sure we've got those clear alignments working through in terms of those arrangements, in terms of the consultation. Um, it's also about saying actually the two steps are unhelpful, that actually it should be consistent in terms of the provider license breach. Um, and the part of that enfor um, enforcement action is about us getting akin and making sure that we are responding to NHS England. And it plays out in terms of the next item, in terms of memorandum of understanding, that this is about us as a system working together. And we are, you know, the sum of our parts. And actually, we can't put one part of the system into enforcement action without the whole system being impacted. And that's the core drive in terms of the response around the enforcement action. If I may move on, Chair, unless you want to stop and take questions on the enforcement action. No, no, no deal with the two, Lisa, and then I'll look at that afterwards. Brilliant, thank you. So in July, I presented to the ICB board the NHS system oversight framework. And the, the memorandum of understanding is about how NHS England will work with the ICB in regards to the implementation of the oversight framework. And it, it is fundamentally based on our own governance and obviously will be updated to reflect the decision making framework should we approve it as the next item. But it is fundamentally our reflection of our governance, how we work with NHS England through that governance and is a reinforcement of the fact that we work through the ICB, we work through the system and the system is the fundamental partner within that. That's reflected both into the um, 
system oversight framework, but also into the um, NHS England quality board framework in terms of working that through the system. So it's about that reinforcement of working through the system, making sure that we have a clear relationship and arrangement. And that's what the MOU um, um, and details. It is a national template, so this is incredibly similar to each ICB around the country, but it is reflecting our own governance structure, our own committee substructure, and then um, hopefully subject to the next item, our own decision making framework within that. What I have suggested is that we review that in February, one, so we can reflect the enforcement's guidance when with the consultation is finished, but also the work that the chairs and chief execs around the seven ICBs in the southwest have been undertaking around the NHS England compact in terms of that working arrangements working through. But really happy to take any questions, Chair. OK, thanks, Lisa. The, the papers have been circulated. There's a lot of information in there. Um, hopefully you've had, you've had a chance to see uh, all of it. Uh, but I'll open up to questions and comments. So uh, Shane and then John. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Lisa. I think the really important bit about the enforcement, at least made that very clear, is that if we are a system and we act as a system, then we, we stand and fall as a system. And the idea of having individual provider regulations, individual enforcement on a on a provider within our system doesn't make sense. So I think that's a very strong support that we when we write back to the consultation is the strongly support what's in the letter because it, it completely flies in the face of what we're trying to do around cooperation about partnership and engagement. So um, I just want to you know really emphasize that point. We we stand and we fall as a partnership. We don't stand and fall as individual organizations. Thanks, Shane. Uh, John, Ellen, then Rosie. Uh, thanks, Jeff, and thanks, Lisa, for the paper. Exactly the same. Uh, exactly the same point as um, as Shane. We're, we're investing an awful lot of effort into uh, partnership working, uh, you know, building relationships, supporting one another, so that we get the best outcomes for the for, for the people we serve. I think if we were to get to to, to what would seem like a perverse point, we would have effectively failed in our remit. We absolutely. Have to have, have to stand together. That is that is where our strength is. So so again, kind of full support from from me. Okay, thanks, John. Ellen. Thanks, Jeff. Um, thanks, Lisa. Great piece of work. Very comprehensive. Um, just want to agree with uh, Shane's point on agree that we stand and fall as a system, so we can be challenging within. But you know we stand together to um, to work through as a system. I suppose Lisa, um, haven't gone into a bit of a detail on the memorandum of understanding. I think you're asking us to approve the <laughs> memorandum of understanding. Um, just on page 155, I think it is of the board pack. Um, there is a uh, a governance and oversight um, that relies heavily on the outcomes, performance, and quality uh, committee. So I'm I've obviously got sort of an interest there. Um, I just think we just need to um, develop our thinking a little bit on the. Per it's not necessarily for this the, for, for the board at the moment, but but perhaps Shane and the other exec can, together with myself and some of the Neds, have some thinking on what you want of the committees because you know we've got a number of different priority areas, um, and I think we need to really consider what we want to, what what the board would like us. To look at so if that's something we could look at over the next month i would really appreciate that ellen of course we can review that as part of the terms of reference of the committee and, and how we make sure that we support the committee because we may need to have substructures within that that allow the committee to deliver those functions okay thanks very much thanks, uh, 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 my just additional information jeff and it's just to um advise board members in the pack you've got the national guidance on quality risk response and escalation we also have kind of national a local framework that we're using which um is helping us risk mitigate and work together so coming back to that kind of uh, standing together and, and and managing risk together that's in place locally and it's worked really effectively around a number of issues either with individual providers or across a pathway and we're now taking that into a regional conversation with other chief nurses from ICBs again to make sure we've got the right quality governance framework around everything we do, which will help us reduce our risk um, and therefore help us reduce uh, uh, hopefully the need for any enforcement action in the long term. Okay, thanks, Rosie. Uh, Alison and then Steve. 
Yeah, a, a really good piece of work. Just two two quick comments. Um, I, I was also I had also been drawn to page one five five, but I think in terms of understanding what role all subcommittees have or not in terms of helping this MOU, because some are all are in the all are in the um, diagram and some are mentioned in the narrative. So it, just understanding clarity what's in and out. And I guess the the big thing for me is. Can, can we use some live examples of how using the MOU takes us to a different place to to what it would have been like before? So rather than I don't want to create an industry, but what's what will be different with this MOU and uh, MOU and actually following some things through that come to a conclusion that is different because we have the MOU or not? So just understanding the added value it's going to bring other than being a piece of paper, because that's what we don't want it to be. We want it to be something that that's lived. So uh, I in time, it would be good at some point, Lisa, ah, if we didn't have the MOU, this is what we would have done, this is what we've done now, perhaps. And I think, Alison, this plays into how we work fundamentally with NHS England and their own operating framework, which they've also published. So I think it is about how we then can nicely push back but it's also building that partnership relationship with NHS England and and, and I and I apologize to my local authority colleagues because this is a very NHS um, NHS focused document um, and I think that there's a bit around how we work with them and how we make sure we're providing the confidence and assurance because you know we are a national health service there are key indicators that we need to report to i think this document will evolve over the life of the icb and the life of nhs england which is one of the reasons why i think it's important for us to review um, but also i think that the play into this is also as we move forward our oversight framework will change so at the moment there are 67 key metrics that sit within the oversight framework which is why i think the play of the different committees is different so, you know, there are less in primary care currently. We would expect that to change, particularly with the current um, Secretary of State's um, sort of priorities. So it is that bit that we will have to evolve and flex it through in terms of our governance structure, which is why it was so important to have the whole governance structure in there. But happy to pull back through case studies. Okay. Thanks, Lisa. Uh, Stephen and Rosie again. You're on mute again, Steve. Sorry, sorry, Chair. This this comes alive when um, when those case studies are there, and I think that we you're right to highlight that this is how we engage up to NHS England and region, and how they engage with us. So there's probably some work to do to make sure that that works effectively. But then at each of the organisations in the partnerships also will need will we'll need to reinforce one system. We stand together and we support and and that does mean resetting perhaps um, some practices. So I guess my plea is that we the document is fantastic, but it's dense. And what we need to do is then make it a document that we can translate so that people can engage with it at board level in different organizations and that we can then use those stories to get to get it to stick effectively my worry is that it otherwise we we get lost in a very dense document and what we need to be doing is the behavior culture piece thank you steve we can do that thanks steve rosie Mine was an offer. Um, uh, I had an extended meeting with the health and care professional leaderships in the system yesterday. And one of the pieces we are going to do is do some case studies to test, stress test the risk and decision making framework that we'll be discussing next. So one of the proposals, Lisa, was to do that alongside some uh, delivery colleagues and make sure we take a health and care professional and delivery colleague approach to testing our new models. So I'd kind of planned that for the spring, letting our, our provider colleagues get through the, the worst of the winter period and then um, plan to do some real life. Uh, and what we planned to do was around a real life uh, tricky issue at that point and, and test how we would do differently together on that basis and also how we might innovate around our clinical pathways. Perfect. OK, uh, thank you, Rosie. I mean, we've been asked to uh, agree the memorandum of understanding. I, I think Lisa's point was in was useful, which is this is a very NHS centric document. And I suspect if I was sat here from a local authority, I would be now probably putting the kettle on um, because, uh, you know, you, how we engage as a system is all important. But I think that the point that Lisa made is a really good one, which is this is going to evolve. 
And I think if we're successful, this will evolve and, and the, even the oversight framework will start start to change significantly. So um, is there any dissenting voices to us agreeing the memorandum of understanding? No, OK, thank you very much. I'll move us on to the next item then, which I think hopefully will generate some discussion. Um, and that's around the decision making framework for us as, a, as an ICB. So Sarah, I think you're going to lead on it. Thanks very much, Jeff. Um, and Shane did trail this a little bit in his chief execs update. I mean, I think this is a really important um, document for us in terms of just giving that clarity about how we're going to be making decisions in the ICB and for, our, for all of the people within our system, for them to have the clarity of, of where different decisions get made. So um, the Health and Care Act changed um, the responsibilities of all of the statutory, of the, one created us, but it also changed the responsibilities of all of the statutory organisations within um, the system. And this really is reflecting then that those changes and codifying that for everybody so that they can understand. It is still, uh, I'm so another apology to our local authority colleagues, because this is very much about the NHS and how the NHS will make those decisions. Obviously, we're trying to do that as much as we can in partnership. Um, and over time, sort of starting to understand more about de how decisions are made in local authorities so that we can bring together. And, you know, in image one, you'll see that we're sort of describing this as we've got both the strategic partnership, which is the integrated care partnership, and then this the, the delivery partnership of which the ICB is one element, but over time trying to bring that all closer together. So the aim of the framework is um, to really allow us to make sure that functions and decisions of the ICB can be delivered in a timely, responsive and proportionate manner. Um, and it's aligned to our uh, scheme of reservation and delegation and our SFIs. Um, so distributing decisions in accordance with what we've set out there. So image two um, on page uh, 219 of your pack basically um, is really what we've set out in terms of the different levels of decision making. So um, just giving some examples of the types of decisions that would be made at those different levels um, and so that so that people can be clear. So, um, you know, the, the integrated care partnership, very clear that that's all about setting the strategy. It doesn't have any delegated authority. Um, it is just it is about setting the strategy. The ICB board then taking decisions on everything over a million pounds and setting out things like the uh, agreeing the joint forward plan, the um, operational plans, the medium term financial plans, for example. Um, the committees then really having that oversight and assurance function of all of the um, elements of our work. And then the system executive group um, being there to um, to one, progress things and actions uh, between board meetings, but also um, for decisions that are sort of between half a million and a million um, so that they can be made in a more responsive way. And then those decisions will be reported back up to the board and then the assurance committees can uh, dig into those if they, if they choose to. Um, we've then sort of set out um, some the, the work of the um, health and care improvement groups, which we you've got an image on page three, which shows the four health and care improvement groups that we're proposing, which is really where um, partners can come together to agree the issues that need to, to be decided on in those four areas. The appendices really set out some examples and some flow diagrams to really try and help bring this to life because it's I think it's with examples that you can start to see how this would operate in practice. And we've tried to give a range of examples so you can see the things that go that some some um, things can happen within one health and care improvement group. Others, because of the scale of them, will need to come up to the ICB. Others, because of the um, interaction between a couple of health and care improvement groups, then would go to the system executive group so that there's that opportunity to uh, test assumptions between them. I just really wanted to draw your attention to section five, which is the limitations, which is just recognising that we are going to have to pay attention to um, to potential conflicts of interest and uh, and uh, take that forward. 
Um, and also the fact that, as we discussed earlier, that we are this decision making framework is being established during a period of ex of limited resource. So we're not ex so there's a real need for there to be that rigorous assessment of benefits when we're making investment decisions, because it's going to be about moving resource from one bit to another and therefore setting up the infrastructure in the right way so that we can have that rigorous testing before we set off on those journeys. So really happy to take any questions. Um, and you know, thank you to everybody that's input to the work to date, because there has been a lot of engagement uh, before today. Uh, th thank you, Sarah, and the, and the paper is comprehensive. Um, com comments and questions from people. So just one, one for me to start us off then. Um, in any organisation, if we don't empower the chief execs or the exec group to be able to make decisions and get on and run the business, then you, you will suffocate the organisation. Um, however, and I've discussed this many times with many people, but certainly with Shane, um, one of my observations about us as a partnership previously was that the exec group, uh, because we weren't a statutory board, acted as a filter. And it acted as a filter, which meant that some things didn't get past the exec group, which actually should have. So they should have gone to the board to make a decision on whether we were going to deal with issues or not. And so um, there's a danger that those issues that become really, really difficult, thorny or, or challenging don't get aired at the board for discussion. So just some reassurance around that. Now, I think the, the financial caveat is a good one. Um, and I know in the conversations with Shane that he's talked through this, but I think it'd be helpful for the boards to understand the, the role of that exec group um, and their you know, because otherwise everything might just fill, uh, funnel and then be filtered by that group. So, Sarah, I don't know whether you want to answer that or whether Shane does, and then I'll open it up to questions to others. If I may respond, Jeff, for the benefit of the group, and we have discussed this at length, because I, I too would have had concerns that if it ended up being that the executive group took all the decisions and all the board was doing was ratifying those, then it's a completely dysfunctional board. So the best way I want to describe is there will be stuff that this board will ask to be implemented in the system. We need somewhere for that to go to, and that's what the executive group is there to do. So if as a result of this board meeting today, there are a number of actions to be taken forward, then we need to, we need a, we need a landing place for those <laughs> so that we can actually enact them. And that for me is the chief executive group. But there will also be a series of what you're going to call continuous improvement conversations that just need to happen. And if we're always going to have to say, well, we can't have those conversations until we get to the board next month, then actually the system gets jammed. So it's not only an enabling from the board, but it is also an ability for us to work as chief executives to solve problems and to make improvements before they need to come to a board. So it might be the case that we do a lot of solving and the only thing that actually comes up to the board is that which can't be solved or is a, has a bigger, wider issue. I don't see that as a problem. I see that as a, as a good thing to have, because otherwise this board meeting will be 24 hours long trying to describe and, and decide what it is the system needs to do. So I think for a while there'll be a little bit of suck and see. We're going to try and get the calibration right. So it might be the case that for early on we might bring too much to this board because actually that's you know the early stages i think we'll find a balance as we begin to get into the system yeah thanks shane that's really helpful uh so i've got lots of hands up so uh ellen jaya julian john and then dave thanks sarah really comprehensive piece of work again um i'd like to thank you for for that and i understand um jeff's um concerns but i think um shane has has described how this is really important for you know probably speedy decision making as well so i i really um really appreciate that um a bit specific um do we have the resource across the system to support this sarah because it looks like you know it's planned really really well but you know in practice can it work um and how do we ensure that there's no overlap in decision making i think joe medhurst when she's been at a previous committee or board talked about sometimes we're tripping over each other there's decisions that are sort of being made in two different places does this does that resolve this that that issue and my second question is quite specific on page 228 again 
you've you've given a couple of examples, which is which is really really good news that you've done that. Um, but you've given an example of testing this approach where the my committee again, the Out Outcomes, Performance and Quality Committee, would sponsor an initiative, but not provide any input, which just feels a little bit uncomfortable. I think I'm just uh, so my question would be, how could you sponsor it if if there isn't any input? But you might be able to answer that. And I'm happy to take that answer at a, at a further stage. It doesn't have to be done at this board meeting. Thanks, Jeff. OK, thanks, Alan. Uh, Sarah, I don't know whether you want to come back on that. Yeah, so in terms of being able to resource it, obviously we're just in the process of, as Shane updated, in terms of designing our structures to make sure that we are able to resource um, all of this sort of structure. And in terms of removing that, the whole point of this framework is to remove that duplication and to make sure that there's a really clear sort of pathway through for people. There will, of course, sometimes be um, some decisions where they need to be discussed in multiple places because of the com complex nature, but it's trying to help people see the route through that more clearly rather than it being, you know, sort of scattergun, which I think it has been. Thanks, Happy Sarah. to pick up with you sort of on the more Pacific issue, Alan. Uh, yeah, again, thanks for this. It's, it's a really, really good, very detailed work. Um, it, it would be useful, actually, in terms of, you know, the, the issues that we've been raising in terms of headroom funding, um, how 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 this would play out um, for clarity. It would be really good to know if we were going to action things and be more responsive. Um, it would be useful to know how this would play into that kind of decision making and whether or not we would still have to wait through many, many layers or a number of layers in order to, to get things done that might require faster decision making. Yeah, I don't, I don't know whether, Sarah, you want to pick that up or and there's lots of hands going up, so it'd probably be worth listening to the to the conversation and then perhaps summarising at the end and certainly for Shane, because I suspect Shane will want to come in as well. Um, so, John? Thanks, Jeff, and um, thanks, Sarah. I really welcome this. I think it's a you know really good, well thought through piece of work, and I think it's an important plank in 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 how we want to work, and it gives the empowerment. I was just thinking about your point about it being drafted in a time of real flux, and it would just be worth if you haven't already considered. We just you know build in a review at some point, and to you know to learn from it. We don't need to we don't need to set it in stone. I say we could revisit it um, at, at at any point and um, refine it as necessary. But thank you. I think it's a excellent, fully, fully support. Okay, thanks, John. Dave. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, yeah, and and thanks. A really good uh, piece of work again. So um, thank you for pulling that together. Just following a bit of a theme from the last item and some of the the stuff you said, Sarah. There's something for me just around about the clarity of what is in and out. And as you've quite rightly said, primarily this is a governance decision making framework uh, that's relevant to NHS funding decisions. But the first recommendation talks about approving it on behalf of the ICB and all partner organisations. And I think we just need to be clear that it's not necessarily all partner organisations in respect of the wider ICS piece and I think the complication potentially comes in because of course it's a governance decision making framework for the ICB but we also quite rightly talk around about the partnership that's required for the ICS uh, delivery um, uh, as well and just being clear around those two things and um, and by way of example of, of that when we look at things like the um, ICB health and care improvement groups which are quite rightly around about um, uh, achieving delivery of the wider ICS integrated care strategy, um, we need to make sure that we create the flexibility moving forward to make sure that we've got the right people around the right table and we're getting full partnership ownership of that work and that it doesn't become dominated by one sector or another. So I do wonder in that space um, whether, for example, where we talk about partner joint executive SRO um, and that being nominated from an NHS organisation, whether we could, could see or foresee in the future that we might actually want a non-NHS SRO in there. So rather than being so specific, whether actually we just create ourselves a little bit of flexibility to pick up that point that as things evolve, um, we want to make sure that we've got the right people sitting around the table and it doesn't become too, too dominated by different uh, different sectors. 
Thanks. Uh, thanks, Dave. And um, there's, there's a few more hands going up, but let's let's listen to the commentary, Sarah, and then pick them all up at that point. So, Eugene. Thank you, Chair. Uh, fully supportive of this way of working. Um, worth pointing out that th this gives us the content of the ways in which we make decisions, but there is something in there about the spirit and the tone, which is about behaviour, because what what is less than half a million could be a decision made in one organisation that could have millions of repercussions in other organisations and the system. So whilst we absolutely commend that sort of the broad parameters, there is a lot more to do with our behaviours and how we show up and how we absolutely have the opportunity to test and challenge um, approaches, even if they don't meet the financial threshold, because implications may be, be wider and deeper than anticipated. That, thanks, Eugene. Really good point, that, isn't it? About, you know, a million to one person isn't the same as to, to yeah, good point. Um, uh, so I got Vicky and then Shane. And Lisa, you had your hand up, it's gone back down. So uh, presumably we dealt with the point. So stick it back up if you, if you need to. So Vicky and Shane. Hi, and, and leading on to for some of the points that actually been made, um, I think uh, I, I think it's it's great to look at this paper and and see the outcomes that are being aimed for, um, and um, the ways that's going to coming about. One of the, I just want to make a practical point about whether I know that we um, a small organisation, but whether we could be included in the health and care improvement group. Um, as well as sort of some of the other members there, because I think um, the data around, in particular, sort of things like access, which, which which we track over, you know, we can track over a number of years, monthly, um, would would be really helpful to be able to bring to that. Thanks, Vicky. Um, Jane. Thanks, Chair. If I could just comment on a few of the comments that were made, I think. Uh, the spirit and tone, Eugene, is so important. And we actually met with your governors yesterday. Actually, they invited us to come up to the UHPW governor meeting to meet with the governors. And I suppose that the comment I had made to them was it, it might not be that formally every decision has to be a system decision. But what we've got to get is culturally when we make decisions, does it have a systems impact? And if it does, then we need to think about how we make that decision. So you may have something at 250, 300,000 pounds, but by doing it, it has repercussions. And therefore, I think the culture of decision making is about asking the question, does does the fact I'm taking this decision have a system consequence? And if it does, then maybe I need to think differently about how I make that decision. So I think you're so right about tone and about culture. The other thing I think with the with the improvement groups, I have a, have a view of them in terms of them being um, a hub, which is a balance between an executive from the ICB, a NHS lead, probably a local authority lead. So if you think about the one which is about improving lives in the community, there is no doubt the senior leadership in that is not NHS. The senior leadership in that is a combination of NHS, local authority, voluntary and community sector. I mean, we've really got to get the shared ownership of those, even though this framework is very much talking about NHS money. Um, because that's the that's the lens we're looking through decision making, uh, but it isn't about the improvement groups being NHS improvement groups. The improvement groups are systems improvement groups, and therefore all partners will need to be a fundamental part of that, including the voice of lived experience. That's that's that comes back to the earlier conversation we had. You could imagine around that table will be people of lived experience feeding directly into the issue of improving lives in the community or or people with mental illness, etc. So I think the document is itself a really great start to help us make decisions. But ultimately, the proof of this will be when we get into the improvement groups, whether we're able to implement stuff and make change. And I'll just make one very other small reference. I was asked to speak at a conference at the beginning of the week, uh, speaking on how do you make good decisions? It was a really interesting conference. But one of the things was, I think we concluded that NHS, sorry, ICB leaders do not make decisions. ICB leaders are there to facilitate decisions to be made. And for me, this is really what we're trying to do here is create a structure that enables the partnership to facilitate decisions to be made rather than who is the decision maker. And I think the framework really helps to say, OK, how do we facilitate good decision making on our system? And, and I really I really support the framework. There's been a lot of work gone into this by Sarah, by Ellie and, and a load of all of us to try and get it to the right point. And I think it's a really great starting point 
I think we'll review it probably every three to six months as we're using it. We'll always ask the question, was that a good decision and was it made well? So I think we will constantly think about it as the right framework. Thanks, Shane. Some good points there. Um, Deb? Thanks, Jeff. And Sarah, I, I, I'm asking for a clarification because I think I saw it in an earlier version. But where we've got things like digital and obviously the conversations we've had today about how important it is, there could be digital decisions that go across all the four groups. In the 2A section, it also says enablers. So where we've got a really robust um, digital leadership executive already, I presume that's in the 2A space. So it would consult with the improvement groups, but the decision making would be at that enabler and presume the same for workforce, just so that we don't end up with a bit like we've got now, everybody has to go to six different groups before they've actually even got a decision made. Is that is that a correct assumption? I know it's not included in the examples. Um, and Debs, it'd be really good to work through an example with you, but absolutely expecting those enablers to meet as enablers and to have links out into those four improvement groups. Yeah, yeah, so that they're good. able to so that they're able to think about their work program and how it's lining up to support those improvement groups in terms of what they're trying to achieve. But then the decision making yeah. about, yes, we are going to have, let's say, for example, a single packs across our system. The decision making can happen in the enabling group if it's within those thresholds. If not, it goes through. the Yeah, great. Thank you. That's really helpful clarification. Thanks, Deb. Sarah, I'll give you the last word. And, and is there anything from the comments and the questions that uh, people have raised during this discussion that you'd want to come back on? I don't th I think that Shane's picked up a number of them as, as part of what he, he just said. So I don't think there's anything particularly more. I think just really helpful comments. I think that bit about the behaviour and spirit and tone is going to be so critical. And I absolutely recognise that we um, that we are going to need to continue to review this as we go forward. Um, the other element, it's just really on, on the sort of thresholds. Again, that's another one of those things that we need to review as we keep going, because the whole point is that we're trying to make this responsive so that we're able to be um, more agile as an organisation and as a system in terms of being able to take those decisions forward. So thank you. Really great discussion. OK, thanks, Sarah. And I, and I think the point that Shane made around uh, us signing up to this, if we agree this and we we approve the paper and the adoption, then we should all expect to be called out to justify why we've taken a decision without consideration of the wider system, if we've done so. And there will be times when we need we can justify that. Of course, there's going to be individual uh, decisions for organisations, as Shane said. But I, I think this is a sort, sort of recognising that as a board, we sh there's a legitimacy in calling people out when they've taken decisions without considering the wider impact, um, both positive and negative. Um, so I, I'm just putting out to everybody, uh, Dave, I'll bring you, perhaps bringing you in first then, if there's a, a point you want to make. Sorry, Jeff, yeah, if you are about to move on to the, the vote of approval, I think if we could do that in such a way that it reflects Shane's comments because uh, I think there is some greater flexibility that could be built in, for example, to the membership of the terms of reference of some of those groups. I was satisfied with what Shane said, but I don't think that is necessarily reflected in the words of the document at the moment. So if we could give Shane that sort of flexibility to to update it on that basis, I, I'm more than happy. So which bit are we talking about there, Dave, specifically? We're talking about that that ability to be able to make decisions in, in isolation. Um, so, so I... Yes, yeah, so I think th so. An example for me, Jeff, would be at the moment the document says that the partner SRO, for example, on the improvement group comes from an NHS organisation. I think we should have the flexibility to choose which is the best organisation for sake of sake of argument as a small example. It's in the detail, but uh, I think it's just important at this point that it's reflected appropriately. OK, th th thanks, David. If there's any other specifics on, that'd be really helpful to, to feed those back into Sarah. Sarah, Sarah did you have another? Uh, do you want to come back on that? No, it was only that I was going to highlight that, Dave, yes, I really, I've heard that and I'm you know, very happy to incorporate that. And I know that when Shane and I had spoken about the leadership of like the improving the lives of children, we were discussing that it'd be really great if you had maybe like Serona and a director of children's services, because absolutely recognising. And the whole point is that although this is NHS focus, it's really in that 
vein of trying to get to that integrated delivery um, sort of infrastructure, which includes the local authorities, absolutely, and the voluntary sector too. So, yeah. Okay, that, thanks, Sarah, and thanks, Dave. Point, points well made. Um, so, can, can I just check then if we're happy to agree the um, adoption and implementation of this approach? Uh, or if there's anyone who's not. No, okay, so I take it we've agreed. So, I'm, I'll move on to the next item then which is the delegation of decision making for winter expenditure. And I think Lisa, you're going to talk to this. Thank you, Chair. And there's nothing like putting the um, decision making framework in action. Um, so um, we've received an additional winter allocation um, for um, to address um, effectively no criteria to reside to improve flow across the system. It has been allocated, as Shane highlighted in here, is Chief Exec's report um, based both on a fair shares basis but also against the scale of challenge across our system. Um, it has been split into four segments, so one to each of the three local authorities and then an allocation of 8.3 million to the ICB directly. Um, it is intended that it will be put as part of a pool budget alongside the Better Care Fund in terms of that um, allocation. What I'm asking of the board today is for delegated authority against the 8.31 5 million that's been allocated to the ICB to be delegated to the chief execs meeting on the 15th of December to allow that spending plan to be agreed and submitted. Um, alongside that, we are trying to pull together a virtual joint health and wellbeing board chairs meeting in order to sign off the better care element of that funding just to try and balance the both the NHS decision making versus um, local authority in order to have that allocation. Um, the component allocation is coming down in two chunks. So we have a spending plan that must be submitted by the 16th of December. Um, we have activity monitoring that will be submitted on a fortnightly basis from that point on. Um, and the second tranche of the funding, um, which is 60%, will be allocated in January, subject to us having an approved spending plan um, nationally, but also um, progress on delivery against that. Um, so that's my request to the board, Chair. OK, th thanks, Lisa. And that's, I guess this touched on what we talked about with the ability for the executive to be able to make decisions and get on with things operationally. So um, any comments, observations, Steve? Yep, perfectly sensible. Absolutely support it. Um, what we need to be able to demonstrate, I think, on an ongoing basis is impact of how that money is making the difference. Uh, it would be awful if we get it and then we don't get the impact. Yeah, thanks, Steve. Good point. I think that needs to come into our, our committee reporting as well. So, Ellen? Yeah, um, so, yeah, I think this is a, a great opportunity. Um, I note that um, the, the money is based on measurable improvements. Am I right, Lisa? Yeah. So 40% now, 60% in January. Um, I suppose this ties into Shane's um, diagram earlier on about sort of uh, that focus on um, flow, which, you know, is again commendable. Uh, so I suppose what part do you want committees and boards to play? I suppose, Jeff, um, in terms of oversight of of this programme of work, um, it'd just be worth sort of just considering that uh, briefly if if we can, uh, especially given we've got a lot of challenges, including probably workforce at the heart of this. Yeah, because it will, you know, it's a big chunk of money and it will divert attention and perhaps yeah. rightly so. But um, so, so Lisa, I don't know whether you or Shane want to pick that up about, you know, re reporting to committee or reporting into board um and how how whilst it's it's delegated spend um there still needs to be some element of governance around that because a lot of money so yeah. my ex sorry no, go, ahead, Lisa. go ahead Lisa. <laughs> oh, so my expectation is that we will obviously be doing our fortnightly activity reporting back into the national team but i would expect that we would be doing updates formally um as part of our winter reporting both to the outcomes quality and performance group, but also would be going through into the um, chief exec group. So I think we'll have both um, parallel in terms of that reporting. Um, and also um, we know that the scrutiny that is on all of us, uh, both as partners, but also in, as individual statutory organisations through this funding, will make sure that we are fully briefed on it at all times. Because I think the scrutiny that plays out on this is really, it will be really significant. 
can I just can I just come in for for one second? Can I just sort of plead for anybody, you know, whether it's board members or whether it's the committee, that we just have a really simple sort of one page template that just outlines sort of how we are performing so that it's simple and easy to grasp. That that would yeah. be really helpful. Thank you. Yeah, so otherwise it'll get lost in the nine hundred pages. <laughs> yeah. Can I if I if I may, Jeff, just I think this actually lends itself to very simple reporting. And the reason why it lends up to very simple reporting, the central measure here is no criteria to reside. And therefore, the very simple reporting is, are we making a difference in the number of people who are in hospital who shouldn't be in hospital? So I think we can bring it back to that. It's much more complex than that, but we can bring it back to that so we can see, are we making a difference to that number? Because that is the number that we will be monitored on at a national level. That's what that's what government will be looking at. They've said very clearly this money has been allocated to us disproportionately. We've got the biggest share because we have the biggest challenge of no criteria to reside. Okay, thanks, Shane. Uh, thanks, Alan. Uh, I was about to come back to you on that point to see whether we'd answered the question, but um, yeah, good point. Dave. Yeah, thanks, Chair. And just wanted to build on both of those points and not wanting to overcomplicate um, Shane's simplicity of reporting back and rec mm -hmm. and, and I and I do recognise the the time frame around spend um, and, and and the simplicity of the performance criteria. But I think it's also important that as we work through the solutions and we're looking at the short term solutions, we're all we're doing that in such a way that we're building medium to long term sustainability in to the system so that we don't take a short term measure that sorts this year, but then leaves us with similar issues next year. So again, just making sure we get that balance between short term and medium term, long term sustainability and system change uh, as part of that work is going to be critically important. Yeah, thank, thanks, Dave. So, so can I ask whether we are happy to support the delegation uh, of the money to the um, executive function uh, around winter? pressures and around winter expenditure. Any any dissenting voices? No? OK, great. Thank you very much. I'll move us on to um, our last set of substantive items for the for the uh, public board then. Um, the, we've got the update from the ICB committees. I think we'll handle this with the chairs, first of all, um, just giving their update as to how they see their committee uh, progressing and, and any issues they'd like to raise with the uh, the ICB board and then to the executive to talk about a bit more of the detail around some of the, the specific issues for the committee. So let's start with yourself, Ellen. OK, so thanks, Jeff. And, and what I would say is I think um, my um, significant item that I updated on was covered in the, the closed session earlier on. The other area that I just wanted to touch on was patients with no criteria to reside. So in some ways we've covered an awful lot that would be a concern from the Outcomes, Problems and Quality Committee. committee. Um, no criteria to reside rem remains at high levels of both uh, across both acute and community. Um, and we're not yet seeing the impact of the winter schemes that we discussed in some detail at our October board, um, which I think Lisa's sort of referred to um, today. Julie Sharma is leading on behalf of the ICB a focused piece of work on no criteria to reside. I was hoping that I could have brought Julie in and I'm not quite sure whether Lisa um, we're able to facilitate that now. I'm just looking. Well, uh, I was going to say, Ellen, that is the piece of work that Shane highlighted in the Chief Exec's report in terms of the Home First yeah. project that Julie is obviously a sponsoring Chief Exec to. Yeah. And 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 that is the programme of work that um, Deborah, myself, and Dave, in our respective leads, yeah. are obviously ensuring as exec sponsors to make sure that we deliver through those areas as our core elements through that. Um, and, and certainly um, would be very happy to circulate to board members if they would be interested um, the project initiation document that um, Deborah has pulled together in terms of that piece of work, which I think was discussed at, um, and shared with the chief execs, I want to say two weeks ago. So we could do it in that route, Ellen. I'm recognising okay. Julie's on annual leave today. 
Okay, well, I, I find that helpful. I'll leave Jeff to make a decision on whether that needs to be sort of circulated further. But what I was looking for was really progress has been made, what are the challenges, and is there any further support from around the table? But what I'm reading in that is that we are working system-wide anyway, Lisa. So, um, so Jeff, I think that was probably um, the biggest area for um, of concern for um, the committee. And lots of different roads whether we're looking at cancer general elective um seem seem to come back to workforce and i'm not sure whether we should um at some point sort of make reference to um the nurses strike and the implication on that for us as a system yeah absolutely ellen and i think we'll, we'll pick some of that now in uh, jay's input on the people committee but can, can i pass to lisa and then to rosie as to anything that you want to raise around quality performance and outcomes. I, I just wanted to raise to the board's attention um, that we are making progress against our 104, 78 weeks and our 52 week wait performance. We are in line with trajectory. Um, I know that those numbers still are at high levels and for those individual patients, um, it is clearly very distressing, but we are making that progress um, and we are still working to achieve the 31st of March 23 target in that reduction. And I just wanted to raise um, the progress that MBT in particular have raised made in terms of cancer two week waits. It's not yet being reported in the numbers, but we are um, by the hard work of their team in terms of putting on mega clinics and also um, um, consistent validation of the waiting list. We are now seeing uh, uh, starting to see the improvement on a two week waits for breast surgery, um, which is really important in terms of for those individuals, but also in it moving us towards achieving the target <coughs> for both two weeks and um, 62 days. OK, uh, thanks, Lisa. That's really helpful. Uh, Rosie. Thank you, Jeff. The only thing I was going to draw out was around C. difficile, which is a, an infection. Um, and just to note that we're seeing a national rise in rates of C. diff infection in the population. Um, we remain under the England and underneath the regional average, but there's a national rise. Um, so it's work on going at national level to, to understand why that is, because it has quite a significant impact on mortality for our older people. So we'll be watching that very carefully through committee and um, if need be working with our med doc colleagues about any change in practice we need to apply. OK, thanks, Rosie. So can I ask board members whether there's any uh, comments or questions they want to raise with uh, Ellen, Lisa or Rosie? No, OK, I'll move us on to the next item, which is people committee. So let's start with yourself, Jay, and then move to Julie. Yeah, th thank you very much. Uh, actually, does that mean, Julie, did, did you want to talk through the terms of reference bit as well? I can skip my bit of that, if you like. Um, yes, I can do. I think there's an item, Jeff, for approval. It was the revised terms of reference and then there's two, the two committee meeting reports. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm happy to deal with it either way. So whether, whether Jay wants to give an update on the committee and then when we do your update, we can move to that sub substantive item in there, Julie. Great. So I'll, I'll just go through the, the October and November meetings for the ICB and ICS people committees uh, respectively. With the ICB people committee, um, there's a comprehensive plan in place and in action, but the greatest risks are, as ever, the available resources to, to deliver against the actions. Um, key to this is, of course, the appointment of um, our, our chief people officer. Uh, interviews have taken place, um, uh, as, as Ellen has highlighted, so um, I won't talk more about that until we've got something to present on that. Issues being raised from our staff partnership forum are echoed through our system-wide discussion, so I'll cover those next because they're all pretty much in common. Um, OK, so November with the ICS People Committee, uh, we've had um, updates, as we said we would put in, including well-being. Um, again, not surprisingly, the biggest issue is burnout, which of course leads to attrition. Um, there is a huge and rising need for our people to have access to this level of support. And as I understand it, funding is up in the air. And um, I know national conversations uh, were in progress uh, last month, um, but I haven't heard on what those updates are. So, Julie, I don't know if you know anything about what's happening to that funding on, on the health and uh, mental health and wellbeing hub. 
sorry, it's um, still being considered nationally at the moment. I think you're referring to the funding that was made available last year to set the yes. up. And there's a question about whether or not um, we're going to get further funding uh, in the 23-24 financial year. Um, and I, I don't, the, a decision hasn't been made on that yet. OK, so that, that will have an impact on, on how we try and mitigate all of that as, as a system. We did have a lovely uh, report on the workforce dashboard, um, uh, although it, it's showing us why staff are leaving. Um, and the stark reminder that when we open our Amazon orders this Christmas, the chances are they were packed by former nurses from BNSSG and various other places. So there are many things, many lessons to be learned. Um, we will also hope that the social care needs will be worked into these plans on the dashboard as we go. Julie did some great work with Corey um, Hartman um, on workforce planning and cost of attrition and calculating uh, some sort of guide value so that we could start to see how we could think about the losses in terms of investments required rather than just, you know, watching them put her away. Um, so that there's a there was really good work that Julie could also talk about on on the financial cost of BNSSG, for, for example, filling band five vacancies using agency staff. Um, and, and I'm hoping these figures will inform our, our headroom funding discussions and especially in light of what we've talked about the decision making. Cost of living report is a rolling agenda item um, uh, and the work being done on people program board will be critical to dealing with how, how we hang on to our staff and make sure that they, they can afford to work and deliver the best they can in terms of productivity. ICS people program report um, was presented to us. Um, uh, it's still embryonic, but we were told that we've got a one, three and five year plan um, and now we'll be seeking to find some solid metrics that will help us lead to greater retention, recruitment, skills development. Um, and then the thing that's rising up for me greatly is about engendering loyalty to the system, not just individual um, partner organisations, because if we are going to act as a system, we have to be seen as a system and that's to do with communication. So we also need to look at not just individual trusts and partnership organisations and their benefits, but the system wide value proposition for employees and, and, uh, and the associated rewards. Um, and also we have committed to talking uh, to finding out more about um, the resources hidden within our third sector partners and our communities. And, I, um, and Julie was given a, a, an action point in order to, to work what that one and um, work out what the detail is on that. So these are all work in progress. And so we're, we're really hoping that we will be able to uncover more resource where, where, we, where we need it most. Learning Academy was also updated and I've set up Trello boards to talk about horizon scanning items that we cannot necessarily look at during meetings because they're very tight. Um, so hopefully we can gather some thinking and uh, some problem solving ability between meetings um, based on um, the expertise within the room. Uh, and that's pretty much where we are with that. OK, thanks, Jay. Jay, I don't know if it's your microphone or whether it's somebody else's, but we can hear a lot of typing and conversation in the background. So it, it might be yours, but it, it, if, if not, uh, can others check their microphones, please, just to ensure they're, they're muted while we're talking. Th thanks, Jay. Can I pass to Julie before I open up to questions? So Julie, if you want to pick up the issue of the terms of reference and then any other issues from the, the people committee before I uh, go to the board. OK, so the first thing on the terms of reference is that um, obviously we we do review the terms of reference and there's been a um, couple of updates that um, we just like having them signed off by the rule, please. And um, it relates to attendance. So um, one update was to add the um, ICB chief financial officer and, and deputy chief executive to the ICS people committee. Um, because we've spoken about funding, availability of funding to support workforce, um, and so the committee felt that uh, as a, a, a member alongside a number of other ICB executives, um, the CFO would, would um, be very welcome. Um, and also um, in relation to the ICB people committee, so this is the one that's more internally focused, um, we'd also um, added a second um, non-executive uh, member, um, and that's particularly so we could meet the quorum rules um, uh, that are set for the committee. Um, so they were the um, two main um, uh, amendments. OK, thanks, Julie. Anything else you want to add from people committee or? No. Um, well, in terms of updates, I think it might just be worth um, reporting in around the ICS People Committee that um, it does receive the um, 
operational plan, the workforce um, uh, gap that's in the current year's operational plan. So we do monitor that via the committee um, and obviously the um, trajectory of the potential year end position was reported into the last meeting. So that is a regular standing item and will continue. Um, and also we did um, brief around the um, potential industrial uh, industrial action as well uh, and obviously the, the situation um, has slightly changed now since the committee because we do have some formal days for industrial actions set um, but we did um, I did provide a briefing of the background and the um, uh, the some of the uh, legal um, situation uh, and also um, likely timelines for action. Okay thanks Julie. Um, can, can I move to questions? But the first one for me, really, for Jaya, which is um, just to, to comment on the contribution of non exec directors from our partner organisations as part of the People Committee. How are you finding that? Is it valuable? Um, and then perhaps that's a question for the wider board as to whether, whether that is feeding back into the organisation as well. So, uh, Jaya, and I suppose it's a question to all of the NEDs. Yeah, I, I am finding it very helpful, um, especially given that it gives us a connection with with uh, our partner organisations and their perspectives of, uh, really do enrich what we're trying to do. We, we as a committee don't see as much as they do. It's really it's really important to have that perspective from my perspective. OK, thanks, Jay. And I, and, and I don't know if that's reflected across other committees, but I, I didn't ask Alan, but we could pick it up in updates. So, uh, Steve? I think it is valuable. The the issue for them clearly is the time commitment and sometimes clashes with other meetings. But certainly on the finance um, estates IT one, we get input. So we'll get a written input if there are queries and questions. And I think that's just as valuable. Yeah, good. OK, thanks. Um, Ellen, do you want to come back in and then Alison? Yeah, just just quickly, I would say for the last meeting, we had um, input from Paul May from Serona, Hugh Evans, who might actually be on the call, and Sue Balkan from um, UHPW, totally sort of a game changer in terms of contribution and um, and and really system wide thinking. So I really really appreciated um, their input. So so really good. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Alan. Alison. Yeah, um, really important contributions. Sarah Purdy from MBT and Amanda Cheesley from Serona uh, have almost rotated being the second uh, non-executive member. And I think they've both said they get, they get things out of it too. I don't know whether that goes back into the organisations, but it certainly makes committee a lot richer having their perspectives. Yeah, thanks, Alison. And, and, and you, you know, I've sat on, uh, I sat on most of the committees and regularly do. I have to say the contribution that our partner NEDs are making to those committees is as reflected by the NEDs. Uh, I saw a significant change in the Quality and Outcomes Committee this time from last time. It was a different conversation. So um, it's, it's just the appeal to chief execs on the on the call, which is I know how busy your NEDs are inside your own organisation, but I think actually they're getting something from this, which will feed back into your organisation as well as the contribution of those committees, which otherwise can just be set in a world of their own. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's helpful. Thank you. Um, so can I move to Steve then on finance estates and digital? Thanks. Thanks, Jeff. I think um, I'll start just by saying that what's really good uh, in our committee now is that, that we've got a very clear read across, which is finance, estates and digital help us deliver both in terms of our people, but also in terms of the quality of our provision. So one way or another, that finance piece is central because that enables us, if we get that right, to do the investments that we need to do to support our people to deliver the quality of care that we all want to deliver. So the read across, and we'll be getting better at being able to pass, uh, I guess, pass information through to other committees and identify areas where we've got concern maybe in one part of our committee meetings into the other committee meetings and and vice versa that flow i think is really critical so that we join up at icb level um i think we're getting um a very good mix now of uh, understanding in our reporting both finance uh, revenue capital uh, and also then the implications in terms of estates 
and our digital committee, and that's now feeding through to the ICB meeting. So we're beginning to get a much richer uh, landscape, which is fantastic. Um, good engagement, um, uh, again, uh, across a number of domains, which I think helps us understand the ecosystems that we're dealing with, um, and also beginning to work really effectively at system level. So really lifting our eyes up. That said, um, you will see in our reports, which I think are very comprehensive and clear, you will see that there are some recurring themes. Um, we are, we all know the challenges that we've got at the moment. The, the big, I guess the big ask is that we continue to focus on savings delivery because that in the immediate will give us headspace and room as we go forward. And at the moment we're running at about 65% of savings delivered. We, we really do need to do the savings in this year because if it slips, it makes next year even harder. And we know that it's going to be hard anyway. So it looks challenging, but the system it needs to continue to support itself to deliver those savings because that gives us the space to do the investment uh, and to be innovative and creative. We also, I think, in our reporting, um, have a real um, desire to want to see how we can do things differently. And that does impact on the other committee structures and the partnership working. So it's very clear that we've got a workforce issue in terms of being able to create a workforce fit, fit for what we want to deliver going forward, productive, energised, all of those things. But we are at the moment um, suffering, I think, a little bit in terms of having to use huge sums of resource to, back, to, to be able to find agency staff to come in because we can't recruit. And that is that's gonna gonna keep holding us back, I think. So there is something about us doing a serious piece of work as we look at schemes coming forward, which might be really innovative capital streams of work, understanding the workforce implications and challenging ourselves hard about what workforce can we create that is different, what technologies can we use that will make us more efficient and effective, um, and more productive in our environments. And if we can get our finances right, it gives us the headroom to invest, to save and do things differently going forward. So I know it sounds that we're saying this every time, but it's so critical, I think, to what we're doing going forward. Um, there's some really innovative um, proposals that we're looking at at outline business case level, which we've considered earlier today. But the key is not the build itself. The key is how we operate it, how we get it to work and how we get benefit through a different sort of approach to delivery. Uh, and the rest of the report I'm taking as read, Jeff, it's it's pretty clear and I'm sure yeah. Sarah will be able to to add. Yeah, I mean, th thanks, Steve. I mean, there, there, there does appear to be a maturity of the, the, the finance group from a period of time. And I think the more we can replicate that across all of our committees, I think it'll be really helpful. But Sarah, is there anything else you want to add to that? The only the only thing I wanted to add is, you know, we're really pleased to have um, Nina Phillipsis join us last time from at South Gloss Council. It's really good having that perspective on the committee as well. So, um, yeah, thank you. Otherwise, okay. Steve covered everything. OK, thanks, Sarah. Can I ask if board members have got any questions or observations for um, either Steve or for Sarah? So, Shane. Thanks, Jeff. It's actually pulling on the conversation we had earlier around the role of digital, particularly about tech in the community, et cetera. Is, I suppose the, the question, the challenge, Steve, is how do we maximise at the committee, not just the focus on finance, and I don't mean finance just for finance sake, I mean, because there's a focus on finance for technology or finance for estates. But actually, if you think about the conversation we had earlier around the importance of tech in the community, the importance of innovation, and really quite exciting conversation I had this morning, how does the Fed committee become the home for driving and that as well? 
because actually if it's finance estate and digital then it's not just about the money side of digital it's actually the much wider exciting conversation around digital and therefore you know i, I appreciate where we start from and, and rightly so we've had a big focus on finance because actually finance doesn't work the whole thing doesn't work so it's not a criticism it's a question now pushing forward how do we really get the, the, the exciting journey of digital into the committee as opposed to the money for digital into the committee, if you know what I mean, Steve. So just as a challenge, I wonder whether the committee's thought about in that way. I, I've thought about it and I've sort of got to the point where I'm not sure in committee is the answer. Okay. I think the committee should have an oversight. The committee should try to understand the direction that we need to go in and be able to articulate it. And that means working closely with uh, service you know, and well, the whole system really to, to really understand. Then I think there is a subgroup of task and finish group with the right people around the table that can develop the case studies or pilots that we must do in order to prove what we're trying to do in terms of a bigger rollout. And I'm not sure that the committee itself can do that. It's a it's a sort of a, a task and finish group that brings in, you know, I'm going to say I would have around the table, not just, uh, you know, the clinicians, some some, but some industry sector that we might partner with, universities that we might work with uh, and try and get some grip on this, which would then allow us to accelerate it subject to getting the money right. Because we could all to, go off on flights yeah. of fancy and then realise, oops, we've got no workforce, we've got no money. And I suppose what would be interesting is the role of the committee is to check, to challenge, to support, to compel. So it needs to do that both in the finance side and in digital and in and in the state. And you're right, you can't do the business at the committee. The committee's job is to check, to challenge, to support, to compel, but to make sure it's happening down those three finance, state and yeah. digital. Just, yeah. Steve, and I, I would agree with that, and I'd absolutely agree with what Shane has just said. Just reflecting back on my time in UHBW, a lot of my conversations there with the digital teams were, um, yes, but we haven't got the strategic direction, so we know what we want to do. We're already excited. We want to get on with these things. We're reporting it, but who is providing us that clarity about the space we need to occupy? So there needs to be something about how that comes to the board, how that comes to the exec group, how that comes to your committee to make sure that people know that they're supported and go in the direction that, that they're heading. So, Deb, you might be able to answer that one for us. Well, I, th I think it's we have the Digital Delivery Board, which is the CIOs, which I chair uh, across the system. So I think we don't need the task and finish group because I think that does that piece of work and brings all aspects of the system. I think what's difficult, if I'm really honest, in Fed, it's really difficult to have that breadth of conversation. So to have the the breadth of challenge around the cyber agenda and to have the breadth of challenge around the informatics agenda. So, so I, I think we're still working through it, as Steve said, and we had a conversation about, you know, right now it's about the money side of things to try and make sure that we get that right. But I wonder whether as we go through the, the governance structure, we need to continue to review. I think it's a really hard ask to shove those three things together that are by nature really quite different. So I think there's, you know, there's big overlaps, but and, and I would say that wouldn't I? And you would expect me to as the chief digital information officer of this board um, that I think if we're really going to be clear about digital, I do think it needs a, 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 another place to have those in-depth conversations and that level of oversight. But I think that's one for another day. So, well, Deb, I'm open to suggestions on that. It's just that uh, I know, again, in my time in UHBW, if you didn't put digital and estates as a name into a committee, they didn't get talked about. So what happened is you talked about the finance and then everyone had a conversation in the margins about estates and, and um, uh, digital, but nobody knew what was going on. So it, it, I, I do agree they may not be necessarily happy bedfellows, um, but I don't want to end up with eight committees. So um, I, I'm open to suggestions on that one. I'm sure I'm sure people will have them. So I've got a few people, Julian, John and then Lisa and then Jaya. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, and I think maybe one of the things uh, looking back at the conversations we had earlier was 
how do we make digital part of the conversations of all the committees, actually, uh, if digital is so important to underpinning everything we do? So it's not, you know, the digital aspect of Fed could hold the assurance and, and monitoring, but actually in terms of the transformation and moving things forward, these are conversations that should be happening more broadly because otherwise, as to your point, no one talks about digital, but actually we all need to be talking about digital. Julian, I think that's a point really well made, but I suppose we could make that point for most of our committees. So things like workforce, that doesn't sit in isolation, cuts across all our committees. So um, we, you're right, we, we, pigeonholing things in and putting them in boxes isn't great, but we need to make sure we've got a flow through on the governance. So, yeah, we, we, you know, we're only a couple of months in on this. I, I think we've just got to keep thinking this through and, and evolving as time goes on. But yeah, good points. Um, John, Lisa, then Jair. Thanks, Jeff. It, it, it's just an observation uh, from Fed, and I think that subject to it being, you know, two hours uh, once a month, I, I, I feel that we are talking about the right things and that digital is getting pretty good airplay. And I think we saw some evidence of that in, you know, in close this morning where the technology enabled uh, discussion uh, ha had already been been through Fed. And I, I my sense is that we're not particularly hung up on having a financially focused conversation about digital. I think that you know we we, we have Joe there who is bringing a really helpful clinical perspective to you know whether it's the estate or whether it's digital. And similarly, I, I, I wouldn't say Debs that you're particularly focusing on the money. I think you're focusing on 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 the things that we need to be you know that we you know that we need to to work on that are going to be genuinely transformative as we. Uh, as we as we saw this morning, so I'm, I would say subject to how we are currently operating, Jeff, kind of based on the you know the monthly cycle and doing the three under the single uh, umbrella, it feels to me as though it's going you know it's going in the right direction. But it, yeah, it's always appropriate to you know to to step back and to think about whether you know whether things need 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 more airplay. But that that that's how it feels from my perspective. Yeah, and I think for everyone on the board, including committee chairs, you know, let, let's let's come up with some suggestions as we go through. If it's, if it's working, great. If it's not, let's change it. So um, thanks, John. So uh, Lisa, Jaya and then Ellen. Um, thank you, Chair. So I, I'm really wanting to build on what Julian said. I'm wondering whether or not actually what we're what we're being asked as executives is to pull together a substructure to the committee that allows that joint delivery. So, I mean, I absolutely recognise that, you know, actually we often talk in ops teams about actually we need we need a digital solution to this and kind of assume it's being done over there. Whereas actually, you know, if we're designing it, it needs to be with the ops teams in the room. So I'm wondering whether or not actually what we need is a subcommittee structure that allows us to do some of the joining up between the committees in terms of that solution because you know you know we talk about tech in in community delivery we also need to make sure that that tech is then supported by our teams to make sure that they're confident in um but using tech and not being um there in terms of seeing patients and it's 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 a cultural as well as a operational journey that we need to go down yeah so it might be subcommittee it, it might be task and finish group it might be an existing group like deb has described but we need to be thinking about how that's reporting in and where it's reporting in, um, because otherwise they, they, they will operate in spend isolation. But um, yeah, good, good point, Lisa, thanks. Um, Jaya, Ellen, Sarah, and then Steve. Um, OK, so speaking as, as one of the digital day jobby type people, um, it, it does seem to me that um, I think it's great that digital has a home in, in, in one of our committees. I also think that we have to deter we have to distinguish between assets versus functions that are available to us because um, we have we have data assets, we have software, we have. But for me, for example, with 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 a with a workforce in mind, um, digital could manifest in a way to keep our staff safe. It could help us have an identity. We can communicate in a two way kind of way. Um, so it's a means to an end. Um, it will be applied to many different things as any technology is. Um, and and for, for me, it's about visibility of what is available to us in our other boards, in our other committees that we can make use of to achieve our aims. It is all connected, um, but um, they have homes. But I think it's it's also about what we make available. So you guys want my workforce, well, our workforce, um, and I want your tech and I want whatever you've got to help me make sure that they're safe and able to be productive. So, um, you know, quid pro quo, Clarice. Okay, thanks, Jaya. 
Um, Sarah? I just really wanted to pick up on the, some of the conversation and just to remind us of the paper we just signed off in terms of the decision making framework, because I think absolutely those service improvement groups are the place where we should be considering all of those things. And the whole point of having a digital representative on each of those is so that those conversations can then be brought back into a, the digital delivery group. And then absolutely from an insurance point of view, that's then the route back into the Finance, Estates and Digital Committee. And we do have routine reporting into the digital, into the Fed Committee from the finance, uh, from the Directors of the Finance Meeting, from a state steering group and from the Digital Delivery Board. So really that being the sort of cycle, um, so not let's let I just want to make sure that we've only just signed that off and that's the direction of travel we're going in so we do have that digital tie through all of those service improvement groups yeah thanks Sarah blame Steve West <laughs> <laughs> Steve <laughs> I'll rescue it then having blamed having blamed me um I think one of the challenges is we're this is new isn't it we're trying to do a load of stuff all at the same time so uh clarity at executive level um, that how to use the committees is essential and how we get that feed in. And Sarah is absolutely right. We've got we've signed off a governance framework and a decision making framework. So we should really get behind that and make that work. The issue then is we at these committees need to be strategic. In our thinking, connecting in the way in which we use our committees and bring to the main board decisions uh, to be taken. And I think we can do that. I don't I don't have any doubt that that's possible. What we don't want to be what, what the executive absolutely should be doing is making sure that across the system we've got really good intelligence and we really know where we're trying to get to. And that that then is is um, looked at by the committees to make sure that we can keep abreast of it and make the right decisions, because I guarantee there'll come a point very, very soon where we're going to have to say, do we invest in? IT, digital, or do we invest somewhere else? Okay, thanks, Reality. Steve. Thanks, Steve. Jane? My point is very similar to Steve's, which is I think we just need to be very careful about the role of the committee versus the role of the organisation and the system to deliver. In the assurance framework and in our decision making framework, the role of the committee is to for oversight and assurance of relative relevant functions. The committee isn't the committees are not management agents. They have no budget and nor should they. Um, they are in fact oversight to check, to challenge, to support, to help us do our job, but they themselves are not management of the system. And I think it's really important that we just um, as much as I want to get excited by the role of the committees and I, and I really do the executive function through the committee is being held to account by the board and not all of the work of the system could ever be decided or enabled through committees. Committees jobs are to provide oversight and assurance to check, to challenge, to compel us to do something different, but they are not the management function of the ICS and we just need to be really, really careful. The management function of the ICS <clears throat> goes through the executives, through the partners and through our improvement groups. And the committee's job is to check, to challenge, to hold us to account for doing that job well. But it isn't the committees are not themselves management of the system. They are the check, the challenge, to assure. And no, I think we've just got to be really clear because we could get ourselves in a really big mess if we suddenly say the committees are running the system. They're not. They are there to check, to challenge, to provide assurance. Yeah, Sean, you know, we've discussed this at length and we're like minded on it. I think there's yeah. an element of governance in there as well which is about safeguarding the executive decision making. So, um, you know, it, it's it's uh, ha having been sat in your seats as chief executives, um, it, it wasn't, a, it, for me, it wasn't until I got to that top job that I realized the benefit of a board. In fact, when I was more junior in the organization, I could never really understand what the board did. And it wasn't until um, I made some very difficult decisions and I had that top cover as well, which get, which applied the what you've described, the accountability, the scrutiny and the governance of decision making, which helps everyone do their job. So uh, and then protects public money as well and, and public service, which is what we all should be here to do. So, Shane, I think we're all I think there's an agreement on that. And 
and it is early days, but I'm also conscious that I've got five non-exec directors who are really keen to make a difference. Um, and so uh, I'm, I'm keen to make sure that continues. So uh, thank you, Steve. You can see that the conversation that's um, generated. So let me move us on to primary care then, Alison. Thanks very much, Jeff. Um, and just picking up um, Shane's last point, I, I, I really I couldn't agree more with it. And at committee, primary care committee, we we ask regularly, are the connections and the dots being joined up before something comes to us for assurance? Are those connections being made? And I, I think there's layers of that. And I, and I think that's really going to be important. Um, in terms of primary care committee, there's no doubt, I, I think, that primary care it plays an integral part in some of the solutions that the system has got, um, uh, uh, some of the some of the system challenges. Um, and uh, I'll pick up uh, one thing very briefly from the October minutes, um, but focus really on a verbal update from November. And there's a very small procedural uh, uh, approval request for terms of reference, which is not major at all. Um, uh, just in terms of uh, the October meeting, the only thing I would pull out is we we um, received assurance on the winter planning approach for primary care. So this is accessing winter funds and obviously primary care has got a, an important role there in terms of um, serv serving the population, particularly looked at one of the, the main uh, areas of support, which could be more same day appointments uh, in practice. And when I talk about primary care, currently it's around primary medical services that we have delegated commissioning authority for. Obviously, in April of next year, it extends to dental, optometry and pharmacy. Um, two areas to pick out from uh, the November meeting, which I think will be of interest in a context of them. If you if you if committee had to describe what the main issues were fighting primary uh, facing primary care, it's workforce and workload. I don't think it's, I think there's any uh, difference there. The two, the two areas I wanted to pull out was a review of the progress against the primary care strategy. Uh, there are four pillars of the primary care strategy, um, and it's really interesting based on all the discussions that we've had today. One is around models of care, new models of care, improving access, etc. Um, workforce, um, quality and resilience of primary care practices and infrastructure, which um, particularly focusing around digital um, digital enabled systems. So there's an awful lot of overlap, I think, in terms of um, what we've discussed for, for, from other committees as well. Um, it's quite clear there's an enormous amount of work going on uh, to deliver the objectives in the primary care strategy. There's a lot of information presented to committee. I think one of one of my asks last time was, can we um, can we on a page have a sense of whether we are progressing um, on track or not on track in the areas that we've said we're going to deliver on. So, so something a, a more of a visual for an assurance committee to say, actually, what are the key metrics? And um, because there's such a lot of information about what primary care is doing and what we are trying not to do in committee is focus on the description of what it's doing, but the assurance on the effectiveness of what it's doing. Um, but there's clearly a lot of work uh, going on there. Um, the And it's interesting, isn't it, that one of the um, statistics that came out at committee was for uh, over 50% of specialties where there's 104 week waits, um, there are on average an extra five patient appointments with primary care for those if those individuals who are waiting over over that time. So there's a whole connection here on how the how effective the system is in caring for patients. And obviously, if we didn't have people waiting 104 weeks, then that you know, they wouldn't go back to their GPs at least five times during that time of waiting. Um, so quite a lot around primary care strategy. Um, and the question around unwarranted variation. And I, th I still think we haven't bottomed that out yet. I, I saw not quite clear that we're sure what, what are we describing when we're talking about reducing unwarranted variation in primary care? Is it around access? Is it around antibody prescribing? Is it around something else? So I, ha I have asked Dave and the, and the team just to, to, because that's one of the key planks of the primary care strategies to reduce it. But I, I think we haven't quite landed on what the it is um, for us to come to uh, to come to committee for assurance that we're on it. So I think that's that's um, a work in progress. Um, there are lots of additional roles in primary care. Um, I think there were from 2021, there were 280 additional roles. The plan is for to increase that to 397 by March of next year. So again, there's a there's a 
there's a request and ask a commitment to increase the additional roles in primary care. And based on everything else we've said, obviously what we wouldn't want is to rob Peter to pay Paul in terms of those additional roles uh, coming into primary care. Um, in terms of improving access, what we saw just over 50% of consultations in primary care are face to face. The question from committee is, what are we aiming for? Is that good? Is that is that best practice? Is it what we're aiming for? Um, certainly other systems have a lot higher face to face. Is that good? Is that not good? So I think there's still a bit of the so what question that just needs to be worked through about what we're aiming for when we have the raw data coming back from primary care which is a work in progress. And so, so quite a lot on the a primary care strategy. And then the other element just to tease out is the ongoing work around delegation of pharmacy, optometry and dentistry. There's a huge amount of work that the team are doing. There are some opportunities we can see at a committee for having those services part of um, a part of locality working. I think it's fair to say dentistry certainly comes out with an awful lot of challenges. The number of people accessing NHS dental care in BNSSG is falling, both um, uh, children and adults, I think, at the last presentation. And uh, I think I mentioned last time, but there's a major dental reform programme which the board will be interested in because currently NHS England are managing it and running it. It's huge. Um, from April the 1st, they will be monitoring us managing it and running it <laughs> so I, th I think um, I think we there's a lot to be done I think in dental services um, there's a lot of challenges um, I'm delighted we have the local dental rep, rep around the table as we do with pharmacy and optometry but there's there's a lot of challenges around dental dentistry which we will um, come to know and um, very well when we take on delegated commissioning but there is a lot of work going on. Uh, it is going according to plan. It's on track. There's still a lot of unanswered questions, but the team are working really hard on that. Uh, so I think that's probably all I wanted to say on the, the two items to pick up verbally, Jeff. Just in terms of terms of reference, it's a tiny tweak. The previous terms of reference have been agreed by the board. What we've done is just reduced it from three non-executive members as membership to two, nothing else at all, um, just to make it more, more practical and realistic. OK, thanks, Alison. It's really comprehensive. Um, any questions or comments from board members on the Prime Care Committee? Dave? Uh, just to add very briefly, um, Jeff, on the, on those two items, for m members that won't have been around, the, the primary care strategy that Alison uh, alluded to is now uh, in its uh, fourth year out of five. Um, and so cl clearly going forward, we're working, you know, working as one with um, uh, Ruth and John and colleagues in terms of uh, furthering and developing our uh, wider primary care strategy and, and, and embedding that and intertwining that across the whole ICS strategy um, uh, going forward. Uh, and, and in particular, embedding the uh, some of the recommendations, for, well, all of the recommendations of the fuller stock take um, and the wider uh, vision of, of, of general practice and primary care in our system. So I just thought I'd note that wider work ongoing now. And on, on, on delegation, the team continue to work uh, through what we've noted here previously as the safe delegation checklist. Um, uh, and in particular, uh, how we are engaging and working with the commissioning hub uh, as part of NHS England. And we'll come back to the board with that uh, uh, full assurance um, uh, around that early in the new year as we move to formal delegation in April. Thank you, Jeff. OK, thank you, Dave. Uh, any other comments or questions around primary care? OK, thank you. I'll move us on then to uh, Audit and Risk Committee. John, uh, any update that you've got from Audit and Risk? OK, thanks, Jeff. Just a couple of items. Uh, the minutes for um, September are here for note. And just a reminder, um, audit meets on a different cycle, so we just have the five meetings a year. Uh, so September's minutes are here. I gave a verbal update last time as we had just met and the minutes weren't available. There's nothing new to flag. Um, like Alison, a couple of um, points um, here for approval. We've got um, slight revisions to the terms of reference, which really focus on uh, the membership and reflect the fact that all of the independent NEDs um, have, a, have a stake in the governance of um, the ICV and our, our, our members of the, the committee, and also the fact that we are uh, developing our partnership approach, committed to working in that spirit. Um, so hence the local authority and provider members reflected in the terms of reference. Uh, we also have the counter fraud policy, which is a crucial part of our internal control armory. It's been discussed and 
reviewed by Audit and Risk Committee and is now here for approval on the recommendation of the committee. And then just uh, a, a couple of other items to, to, to flag. Um, all, all ICBs have been asked to provide assurance centrally on the fitness to purpose uh, of arrangements around um, our registers of, of interest and management of, um, of conflict of interest. And a joint response will be going from Shane myself, and myself as, um, as accounting officer and uh, an audit chair respectively. I'm confident that we have sound and robust processes in place, but it just seems timely to remind everybody just to to have a look at your declarations. And if there is anything that needs to be tweaked, please just make uh, Sarah Carr or her team aware just to ensure that we are that we are up to date. But as I say, I think we have good sound uh, processes in place. And then finally, just to um, signpost to the seminar in January around assurance uh, around the assurance framework. Uh, it's a really important piece of work around, um, you know, bolstering our, our, our governance arrangements, and we'll complement uh, the ongoing strategic work uh, that, that that's happening at the moment. It will be facilitated by our internal audit lead, and I'm confident that he'll make it really engaging and focus on kind of practical, pragmatic, uh, you know, workable applications. We have fed into the conversations that we've had with them, uh, the, the deliberations that we've been having at board level around how best to get to grips with performance and ensuring that we're focusing on the right thing. And based on what he is seeing uh, in other ICBs, he, he, he's coming into, he'll be coming into the session, uh, hopefully to, to, to help fully further clarify um, our thinking around that. So that was really it from, from me, Jeff, just the, um, the two items for approval and the rest really just to note. Thank you. OK, th th thank you, John. And, and um, ju just to the wider board members, really, just that explanation about our, our committees really have a dual function. They have the function to look at those people employed by the ICB, which is the internal management. And you've heard that you know, so a lot of that will have come out in, in some of those committee updates, which you probably sat there thinking, what relevance has this got to me? And then there's the wider 50,000 people, which is the system that we have responsibility collectively for, for managing and leading. So they do have a dual function. It's the governance of the of the what is the ICB organization and then, and then the wider system um, governance around the way we approach things as a collective. So, um, uh, you know, I think within committees, we're sort of trying to align those into uh, differently. I know in the people committee that's it's sort of two separate meetings, really. Um, but it'd be interesting to get some feedback on that because I'm conscious otherwise we get lots of updates here at the board that people might think I'm not sure how relevant that is to me. Um, any questions to John before I move us into the integrated care partnership update? No, okay, so just a very brief update. Um, in the in the private board this morning, we had the first iterations of the um, integrated care partnership strategy. Uh, for those members of the public or others who aren't uh, board members, <clears throat> an explanation might be helpful. We've got an integrated care partnership, which has got 29 members. Uh, it's chaired by Mike Bell, <coughs> who's the um, council member for uh, North Somerset. And the chair of that rotates, so Bristol will chair it next, and then South Gloucestershire. They're responsible for uh, setting the strategy for the integrated care board, which is this meeting, to deliver. This board has other responsibilities as well, which are set nationally by the NHS uh, and emerge from our locality partnerships. Um, but we have a really important stake in that strategy because we are responsible for the delivery of it. Um, our integrated care partnership isn't a statutory board. It is a, uh, a co committee that's there to advise us and support us. Um, but we know that our, our first iteration of that strategy will um, take place in December in this month, you know, it's a couple of weeks time. Um, what we are working towards is a more strategic framework so we can build in the way we approach uh, health and social care. And then that is we can build on that further as we do more and more consultation with uh, the public and with our patients. So we're a good place with that committee. There is no other um, integrated care partnerships who are leading it in the way that we are that I've seen. I think it's a very inclusive uh, approach and it does bring together uh, health and social care in a way that I think perhaps other integrated care systems aren't doing. So, you know, I think the, the signs are good for it. Um, <clears throat> Colin, I don't know whether there's anything else you wanted to add around the strategy. Um, 
I'm obviously mindful that many of the board members will have heard uh, an update at the private board, but just for the wider membership. Uh, thanks, Chair. I mean, I think you've given a very comprehensive summary of where we are, so I've got very little to, to add to that. Um, just to say, of course, that the <clears throat> the strategy work that we do in the system will be iterative. It's not the case that we will sign something off that will be set in stone. Of course, we will need to uh, refresh and review it as we uh, go forward. But uh, I think all partners are showing real commitment to the idea of working together in the new integrated way and, and, a, and a strategic uh, approach really lends itself to that. So very excited to be uh, involved in the work. We will have to think carefully about prioritisation and the art of the possible. We, we're all aware of the, uh, the the pressures and the limitations uh, within our health and care system at the moment. But I think working together, we can clearly uh, develop more than the whole. You know, the the whole will be greater than some of the parts. So uh, I will regularly uh, endeavour to keep the um, board updated of the strategy work as it develops. And the 16th of December will be a public meeting, so that will be our first outing on the the framework, as you as you uh, rightly described it in the uh, in the introduction. Uh, thank you, Colin. Um, uh, any questions around the integrated care partnership update? No. OK, thank you. Um, I'm conscious of the time. Um, I haven't had any um, particular questions tabled from members of the public. Um, I, I, so we're only going to have five five minutes. Brian, I can see you've got your, your hand up. Uh, I will bring you in a second. Um, please, if you've got any questions for us at all, if you submit them to, to me at the Integrated Care Board, we will ensure that we, we answer your questions in writing, obviously, because I want to make sure that everybody is a fair um, shout at it today. Um, so I'll bring Sarah in just to explain that in a second, and then I'll move to any other business. So Sarah, do you just want to um, update on that? Hello, yes. Uh, so if people send in their questions, there is a link on our board page. Jeff, just to, to highlight, we did receive something from a member of the public, but it was more of a, a statement about how we are engaging with the local um, uh, voluntary sector organisation and we will be going back to that questioner explaining um, we, we, that we've had that question come in from other routes and we'll be going back to that person explaining that that we are exploring our, um, what we can do with that local um, voluntary sector organisation. Sorry that was a bit complicated. But. Okay okay thanks Sarah and we would you know we will it, 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 it's not to, to close those down we will we will give a full written response which we've committed to. Um, but Brian, I can see you've got your hand up. I, we've got five minutes. If we'll do it justice, I'll try and answer it or we'll try and answer your, your question now. If not, we will give you a response outside of the meeting. But I don't know whether you want to just raise the question that you've yeah. got. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, yeah. Because I'm not sure the system's working. Yeah, I've taken an interest in green issues over the time, and in particular now that the green issues raised considerably in this organisation, and you've got a green plan. I've queried things, and... Uh, uh, I suggested that there should be sort of some committee of a small group of engineers, really, who could review the plan for you, because I review, I've looked at the plan at the moment, and I think it's a bit weak, really. I mean, it identifies an awful lot of sources of carbon, but it's nothing about how you get rid of them, you see, or even a good carbon budget. And I'm just going to repeat my sort of offer to try and get the idea of some sort of review panel who could respond to the people on the in the clinical commission not clinical commission within the yeah. businesses it is these days uh, to talk to you know so they could uh, sort of review the thing and, and try and improve it because I mean it's going to become a hell of a problem I, I was somebody on the radio the other day said that if the temperature gets to 40 degrees C and the relative humidity is nearly 100 percent human beings cook you know, 40 degrees centigrade is not that far away for us now. And, you know, that'll make all your other problems look like nothing if we get that sort of thing happening in the country. Yeah, no, I, I think that's a really good question, a really good challenge. I'm going to pass it to Shane in a second. E each one of our partner organisations mm -hmm. will have signed up to their green plan. So we will all have our own individual um, plans towards re reducing the carbon footprint. And um, so but as a collective, you know, there may be some opportunities there. Shane, I don't know whether you, there's anything you would you'd add to that. Well, there was just before the CCG became the ICB, I think it was, we signed off on the um, 
on the overall renewable plan. So absolutely, I mean, I think it would be helpful to see whether we could have that plan reviewed and see what learning there is. So Sarah, was was it through your world, Sarah? No, three healthy together, wasn't it? It was. It is, and and um, we've now got um, somebody in a system wide role working out of MBT um, yeah. who's who's taking the lead on that green plan. Um, so, Brian, if you're happy, I'll put you in touch with um, with Sam Willits, who's who's we, taken we, on that we, role. We, we've said that before, and it's not happened. You see, uh, I think. We, sorry, Brian. I'm, I well, think I, I, no, can I just? I, I'm not really arguing about it. Or, what I would like to do is to get a group of engineers together if we could. I mean, I don't know if I'll be able to do this even, you know, so that you, they can be the people who review it for you because engineers are caused the problem and they're only people who are going to cure it, you see. So, so, so Brian, I think you make a really good point. It's a really good challenge. I think Sarah's offer of, of our uh, system lead, if, if he can make contact with you, we might be able to facilitate some of the things you're suggesting. And I'm great, really grateful for your for your contribution on it. Yeah, thanks. OK, great. Thank you. Um, so can I if we've got any other questions, as I said, please um, write them in, send them to me or to Sarah Carr and we will make sure that we respond um, outside of the meeting. But can I move to any other business for board members, please? Is there anything anyone would like to raise that they haven't had a chance to so far during the meeting? No, so no show of hands. So uh, thank you for your patience. I think it's been a a very productive uh, day. It's been a long day. Um, our next meeting of the public board is on the 2nd of February. Uh, I know I'll see a lot of you before Christmas, but for those of you uh, I don't, please have a safe and um, uh, healthy and happy Christmas and look forward to seeing you all in the new year for our next seminar. See you all soon. Hi. Thank you, Jeff. Thanks. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Well shared. Yeah. Thanks, Jeff. Well done.